Euron Brook and Saifedean Amus. Welcome, both of you, to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having us, Robert. Pleasure Thanks for having us on. Great to have you both. This is a kind of a special edition episode. Uh, we typically have one-on-one -on -one conversations, but today, obviously, there are three of us. Um, the topic of today is the Palestine-Israel conflict. Um, so what I would like to do, uh, we're, we're framing this somewhat as a debate, but I think it's going to be a very structured conversation. So each of you will have be given the same question and then be given certain time blocks to respond. Uh, we will allow for some time for each of you to respond to one another's responses for certain questions. Later on, we'll get into some open conversation, assuming everything's going smoothly. And then towards the end, we'll get into some Q&A. Uh, we posted a tweet to take some questions from the audience. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, you're on Brooke. You are the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. You're an author and the host of the Euron Brook show, and you'll be arguing the pro-Israel side of the conversation. Saif Adin Amus, goes by Saif, is an economist, an author, and host of the Bitcoin Standard podcast, and will be arguing the pro-Palestine side of the conversation. So before we dive into this, and I asked the first question, uh, I thought it would be useful and um, the right thing to do for me to introduce my views as I am the supposed to be the impartial moderator on this conversation, but I do have my own views. So I want to air those out at the beginning. Um, I essentially knew nothing about this prior to June, 2023. Um, Dean and I had a conversation about this previously. Um, and I, I was basically bought into the story in the U.S. that the conflict in the Middle East is some ancient religious war to which there is no solution. Um, I shared this with Safe in our prior recording, but people would even say things like, oh, there will be peace in the Middle East before such and such unlikely outcome occurs. You know, it was almost like a, a joking type of um, thing where people will say, you know, so-and-so has an ice cubes chance in hell of getting that job. Like they almost used it in that way. So I was under that impression. It's some kind of ancient religious conflict that, you know, history knew no answer for. Um, I've since learned that I think that view is a bit limited in many respects. Um, I call myself a freedom maximalist. I think most other people would refer to my views as anarcho-capitalist, um, which essentially is, is anti-state in a very radical sense. Um, I condemn all unilateral acts of violence by any individual or group against any other individual or group. Uh, I actually think it's extremely dangerous to think in terms of group affiliation as it can make our rationality subject to being hijacked. Um, groups I consider to be mental simplifications that we use to contend with a world that's composed of acting individuals that act in accordance with their individual purposes. Um, group identification, I think, is a linguistic shortcut for decomplexifying this world so we can talk about it. Uh, however, the tendency to mistake the map for the territory uh, comes with using group identification as a means of decomplexifying the world. Uh, as a freedom maximalist or anarcho-capitalist, I think the only legitimate use of violence is individual self-defense. So this is an individual defending themselves against an aggressing individual. Um, I don't really have a well-developed opinion on capital punishment. You know, it seems intuitive to me that if there's overwhelming evidence that an individual has murdered another individual, for instance, that the dictates of justice should have the law put that murderer to death. However, the devil is in the details. You know, there's a, there's a lot of complexity as it relates to the judge, the jury, the decision-making apparatus that arbitrates the uh, capital punishment of murderers, for instance. Uh, I view that the non-consensual fiat and centralized state is an immoral institution that's incompatible with human freedom. Um, I think that's probably a view we all share to some extent. Although I do think consensual localized and decentralized government or governance is probably necessary for social organization to some extent. 
my general view on the Palestine Israel situation at this point is that Israel has a significant technological and economic advantage over Palestine, which it is exploiting by waging a mass murder campaign on Palestinians, mostly to steal their land and perhaps tinged with some religious or even racist motivations. Um, this may sound extremely bleak, and I again, I didn't know anything about this less than a year ago, so I could be very misinformed. But when I look at history, I think the exploitation of such asymmetric economic and technological advantages is the norm. Maybe not the norm, but it's happened a lot. Uh, the Europeans conquered the world after coming to dominate gunpowder technology in the 1700s, which led to colonialism, the slave trade. In the 13th century, we had the Mongol Empire using catapults, ballistae, rudimentary artillery, and other instruments of siegecraft to conquer territory spanning from the Pacific Ocean to the Persian Gulf. And today, the U.S. is the global hegemon because of its fleet of aircraft carriers, which allow it to bring city-level devastation to bear from the high seas. So, in general, I think the technology of military capability really defines what groups conquer what other groups. And I think we're just seeing another instance of that in the Palestine-Israel conflict, um, where one group is acting from a position of economic or technological advantage to acting from a place of territorial instinct or group identity politics to justify the stealing of land from another group of humans. So that is my bias in all of this. Um, with that said, I'm going to do my best to just clearly moderate this conversation according to the framework we've laid out. And so to start, um, we're going to start with Yaren. Uh, each of you will have 20 minutes as kind of an opening statement, uh, an overview of this conversation. And the first very broad general question, oh, I'm sorry, we'll also have two minute responses from each. So Yaren will have 20 minutes to answer, then safe, then we'll have two minute response from each of you in turn. The first broad question to get this conversation started is, what is the nature and history of the Palestine-Israel conflict. First to you, Yaren. Thank you, Robert, for putting this together. Thank you, Saif, uh, for um, instigating this debate, I guess. Um, let me start, given Robert's uh, introductory uh, introduction, let me start by saying I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. I, I, I reject anarchy completely. I think it is a, it is a ghastly uh, idea. I think government is a necessary good, not a necessary evil, but it has to be the right government. That is a government that protects individual rights. The government that only function is the protection of individual rights, the right to life as predominant, the right to liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness. I think, therefore, one can look at the world and, and look at government states that exist and basically uh, assign to them a, a, a particular level of goodness or badness, of morality or immorality, by the standard of the extent to which they protect the rights of the individuals to live their lives free of coercion, uh, you know, free of uh, a force, uh, it, it, to live their lives uh, in accordance with their own mind and their own judgment. And one can observe some governments do a some governments are, are relatively okay with this. None is perfect, <laughs> far from it. Some governments are better at this. Some governments are worse at this. Uh, there are governments in which uh, uh, people do not have free speech, where uh, property rights are conditional on what the particular dictator, king, regent, council, political party uh, chooses at any given point in time and at every given moment in time. Uh, there are countries in which uh, people are, are persecuted and prosecuted and and killed, uh, uh, often in barbaric ways, for for example, the the uh, the the sexual orientation or any other kind of uh, individual characteristics for being egoists, uh, for being sorry atheists, or being uh, any anything else in particular. That is, there are countries that are truly evil, uh, that are truly bad by the standard of human right life, by the standard of the protection of individual rights. 
And by that standard, it is, I think, fairly easy to describe the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel is basically a good country. It's not a great country in the sense of it is anywhere close to an ideal, but in the spectrum of countries that exist in the world today, Israel is a country that respects individual rights. It protects property. It has a rule of law. It treats people equally for the most part. It is a country in which whether you're Jewish, Christian, Druze, or Muslim, your rights are protected. Your rights are respected. Again, I'm not going to deny that uh, racism exists. Racism exists almost everywhere. I'm not going to deny that uh, Israel is far from perfect. It is far from perfect. I'm a huge critic of Israel in any other context. Freedom of speech is respected. You can stand up as a Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Druze member of the Israeli Knesset and condemn the Israeli government and support Hamas or the PLO. And you will not be imprisoned. You will not be silenced. You will not be killed. And indeed, Israel has in its Knesset, in its parliament, members who are Christian, Muslim, Jews, and Muslims have served in the Israeli government as coalition members in the Israeli government on occasion. So uh, Israel treats its uh, a, a minority uh, population uh, about as well as any country in the world treats its minority population. And again, they have uh, equal rights. Uh, Israel is a country which, uh, where, again, it's far from being capitalist and it's far from being uh, good, but it's basically a country in which people can speak their mind. People can earn money. People can cre uh, create goods and property. They can, uh, they can uh, uh, innovate. They, uh, they are entrepreneurial. I mean, I find it interesting, Robert, that you mentioned technological advantage as if technological advantage comes out of nowhere. But the reality is the technological advantage is an achievement. It is an achievement of a mind. It is an achievement of men. And when it comes on scale, it is achievement of free men. You cannot create technological advantage, significant technological advantage or technological achievement um, under authoritarianism. When the mind is not free, Israel is has more unicorns, more uh, companies, a uh, billion dollars or more than any other country uh, per capita in the world. Uh, in terms of geographic area, the only geographic area that has more is Silicon Valley. That is a testament to Israeli freedom, Israeli liberty. Uh, Israel's population is about 20% of it is Arab. Uh, over 20% of Israeli doctors are Arab. Uh, doctors in uh, Rambam, in uh, Haifa, who treat Jews and Arabs, uh, a majority of doctors, I think, in Naharia, which is a Jewish uh, town, are Arab. Uh, it, it is bizarre, right? Uh, you know, we, you, you've probably all heard of the accusation of Israel being an apartheid state. It is bizarre that in an apartheid state, an Arab doctor could treat a Jewish patient or a Jewish doctor would treat an Arab patient. I mean, that just never happened under apartheid in South Africa, where blacks had hospitals and whites had hospitals, blacks had beaches, whites had beaches. No such thing exists in Israel towards its Arab population, the citizens of Israel. So again, Israel is a good place. It's a place where human beings as individuals, to emphasize Robert's point about individuals, can flourish and uh, for the most part, encouraged to do so. Now, if you look at the Arab world, what you see is the exact opposite. If you look at the Arab world, including the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership, it is a place where individual rights are not respected at all. Freedom of speech does not exist. In Saudi Arabia and even in Egypt, being an atheist means you go to jail. Being an adulteress means you get stoned to death. These are places where freedom doesn't exist. Individual rights have no respect. In the Palestinian Authority, disagreeing with the ruling authorities is often a death sentence in the name of collaboration. It is authoritarian. The last time uh, Mahmoud Abbas faced an election was 20, almost 20 years ago. Uh, Hamas is a theocratic 
uh, regime dedicated to the establishment of Sharia law. Sharia law is not law that is sympathetic to individual rights, individual liberty, individual freedom, or for that matter, religious freedom or religious liberties. While Jews did not face as much anti-Semitism under uh, Islamic rule as they did under Christian rule, they were still second class citizens as the Quran demands. They and Christians had to pay a tax that was special for them for the fact that they were Jews and Christians. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there were certain professions they couldn't be in, there were certain positions they couldn't uh, attain. They were clearly, unequivocally, secondhand citizens. Again, not as bad as in Europe, but still bad. That does not exist in Israel. Again, Arabs are not treated that way in Israel. The Palestinian Authority, whether uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, whether it was under uh, under Yasser Arafat or under Hamas or under Abbas or under any of its leaders, has been inherently authoritarian, anti-individual, anti-individual rights, as are every single Arab country. I mean, this is not an exception. The Arab world is an authoritarian world where individualism and individuality matters not. So Israel is a good state. The Arabs, not. They are not good states. They are states in, that reject the whole concept of individual rights and as such are immoral. Now, a little bit about um, the history of this conflict. The great tragedy of this conflict is that the Palestinians have chosen or have been assigned, I don't even know, I don't think they ever chose really, but even when they had an opportunity to choose, they, they have had leaders who are authoritarian, oppressive, and murderous. From uh, uh, Husseini, in, uh, from, uh, who became the Mufti of Jerusalem and the leader, the extant leader of the Palestinian people from 1921 on, uh, who was a Nazi sympathizer, uh, 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 visited uh, Germany during World War II, uh, photographed with Hitler, uh, uh, praised the final solution for the Jewish problem. Uh, it was committed uh, to basically not just establishing uh, an Arab, well, he, he never really wanted an Arab state in Palestine. What he really wanted was Palestine to be part of an Arab empire that spanned Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, but he's, he was dedicated to the extermination of the Jewish population in Israel, uh, was dedicated to that er eradication of Jews, killing them, just as the Nazis uh, suggested, and he was one of them. To Yasser Arafat, who dedicated his life to acts of terrorism um, and uh, dedicated his life to basically enriching himself by stealing from his own people and by engaging in warfare between the different factions within the Palestinian regime and rejecting, just like Husseini had previously, any kind of settlement with Israel to establish any form of two-state solution or any other kind of peaceful coexistence. From the beginning, and here the beginning is pre-British mandate, all the way back to the Ottomans, but certainly from 1921 on, the Arabs in Palestine and the Arabs in the Arab world more broadly, and you can't really separate the two because they were very intertwined throughout this history, have had uh, been dedicated to the idea of getting rid of these pesty Jews who were immigrating to what was then called Palestine with the idea of establishing a free country, with the idea the Jews had of establishing a free country in which Jews and Muslims and Christian and Jews would live peacefully. They were committed to harassing them, killing them, taking their property and doing whatever was necessary to get rid of them. The reality is that the Jews who came to Palestine before 1948, this is, uh, you know, uh, those of you who respect property rights, bought the land that they settled. They dried swamps, they built industry, they created a tech advantage. They created it because they built it. They built it by working hard. They built it by using their minds. 
They built it by bringing technology from the West, technology from Europe to Palestine to build hospitals. There's no accident that during uh, the period in which the Jews emigrated to Palestine, the lives of Palestinians, of Arabs within the area of Palestine improved dramatically. Swamps were dried. Mosquitoes, malaria stopped being a problem. Hospitals were built. Hospitals that didn't just serve Jews, but served the entire population. Industry was built. There were capitalists among the Jews who came from Europe and built, not just socialists, as the mythology uh, assumes. There were capitalists who built industries and improved the lives of the local citizens. I mean, the statistics are staggering in terms of the improvement of life expectancy and child mortality and every other aspect of, of Arab life in Palestine at the time. And if you compare it, you could say it's the British, but if you compare it to other places in the Middle East, the British held, it, it's not even close in terms of the differences and how much better life was uh, for an Arab population in Palestine. So these Jews came, they bought land, they built industry, they dried swamps, and what did they get in return? Uh, murder, massacres, starting in 1920, 21, 1929, 1936 to 1939, Arab massacres of Jews constant during this period. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is not just, uh, this is, you know, you can look, you can look at the actual numbers of the number of people died. Now, of course, uh, sadly for the Palestinians, I don't think this was something that was prevalent among, I'd say, the common people. Uh, I think most of the common people saw the benefits that the Jews were bringing. They were bringing jobs. They were bringing economic prosperity. Fewer people left Palestine once the Jews started arriving. They were leaving Palestine quite extensively before because jobs were being created. But this was the policy of the leadership. This was the policy of the Arab leadership for a variety of different political reasons. They did not want Jews there and religious reasons. And this was the policy of the intellectuals. And the common people, as always, are the ones who suffer from the evils of the intellectuals and the politicians. So, uh, you know, during this period, uh, before the state of Israel was founded, all the land that was, was purchased. In 1947, the UN suggested as a solution to the growing violence between Israelis and Arabs, or Jews and Arabs uh, uh, in that period, and the fact that the British wanted to leave, uh, a petition plan, uh, establishing two states. The Jews accepted this. They celebrated it. Literally the day after the UN vote, Pal uh, Arabs started killing Israelis. Uh, in two bus attacks on the, ro uh, on the roads, killed civilians to try to intimidate the Jews and make it clear that no Jewish state would be created. Uh, uh, this uh, expanded throughout this period uh, into battles and cities and villages all over uh, what was then Palestine. The British, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, stood to the side and let it happen. Uh, Jews were attacked everywhere. Um, and uh, the Jews actually won. They made real progress. And as part of this, the Arab population uh, was encouraged by its own leaders, was encouraged by the leaders of other Arab nations to leave. To leave with the idea that when the Arabs invaded, once the Israeli state was declared in May of 1948, they would conquer Israel very quickly and uh, all these people would be able to find their homes back. So people left. Somewhere around 600,000 people left their homes. Most of them uh, most of them left before 19, uh, before uh, May of 1948, a number, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand after. But 600,000 people left their homes, not because they were kicked out. A small percentage were kicked out for strategic reasons. They occupied land that was viewed as a threat. That is, that the Arabs were using to attack Jews and Israelis. But 90% of them left of their own free will. They left because they were told to do so by their leaders. They left because they were afraid, they were scared. 
They left after having been defeated in a war they started. They initiated. And they became refugees. In every other conflict in the world, refugees, after a certain period of time, are settled in the land in which they are in or in some other kind of arrangement. The Palestinians are the only class of refugees that the Arab world has refused to settle, have kept them around now for generations as a sword over Israel, as a moral sword over Israel, as a threat, a permanent threat over the Israeli state. Uh, it's not surprising the Palestine, the uh, the um, refugees were never allowed back. They continue. They continue to seek the destruction of the state of Israel. They continue to seek the uh, the the murder of the Israeli people, and as such, it makes no sense for Israel to accept a fifth column back into uh, in into uh, it, its its own country. Uh, again, I'll just note every opportunity uh, in 1949, Israel um, offered to uh, take back over 100,000. Uh, refugees, um, the Arab world said no. Uh, every attempt that Israel has made to try to achieve peace, every attempt that Israel has made to try to create a two-state solution, to try to resolve this conflict in one way or another, has been rejected by the Arab world and been rejected uh, by the Palestinians. So fundamentally, what's this conflict about? It is about a people striving to establish a relatively free society and another people objecting to that, initiating violence and force against them at every opportunity and trying to not only drive them off their land, but annihilate them in the process. Israel here are the good guys, the Palestinians are the bad guys, and it's still the Palestinians recognize that and change. Um, the state of uh, this conflict will continue to be violence. Thank you. Um Saifedean, I will turn it over to you for 20 minutes on what is the nature and history of the Palestine-Israel conflict. Thank you so much for the invite, Robert, and for organizing this in particular time, and thanks for joining, Aaron. So I'm going to begin this um, my, my intervention here by um, answering the question of what I think this conflict is about, and I differ enormously, as you can imagine, with Aaron about what we view as the cause and root of the conflict. For me, the issue is that this is a conflict of property rights. And in particular, it is a problem. It is a conflict caused by the fact that we have a government that has been built through the violation of the property right of people based purely on the fact of their religious belonging or their ethnicity. And it's a government that continues to survive based on the violation of property rights. There were several uh, factual mistakes that I'm going to uh, refute from the uh, discussion with, with Yaron, but I think an excellent one to start with is his claim that the Israeli immigrants to Palestine bought all the land. And I believe this is an excellent place to begin because it is extremely relevant and simply by debunking this very obviously untrue uh, assertion, we can flip the entire narrative that Yaron presented up to him, flip it against him, because his entire uh, beautiful speech he gave about civilization and about uh, the need to, about why one society is moral and one society is good, all of that is completely exploded once we realize that by 1945, just before the creation of the State of Israel, the uh, Israeli Zionist uh, migrants to Palestine had owned only 5.67% of the land of Palestine. And this is an extremely meticulous study that has been uh, documented very well. And it was done by the British in 1945, and it's uh, you can find it on Wikipedia. I'm sharing the screen here. Uh, the page is called Village Statistics 1945, and you see they did a full survey of all the lands of Palestine, and uh, this is the composition in 1945, which is very similar to what it was, of course, in 1948. So 
As you can see here, in every single district of Palestine, a majority of the land was owned by non-Jews, Muslims or Christians or Druze. The Jews only owned 5.6% of the entire land, and they owned about 10% of the land that was privately owned. So there was, in the south, in the south of this map, if you look here, uh, there's the Nega Desert, or Naqab Desert. And the Naqab Desert is, uh, 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 most of the land in that area was considered public ownership, so it didn't have private owners. So uh, about 45% of the country was publicly owned, 55% was privately owned, which is essentially the part that is still inhabited today. Most of the Negev desert is uninhabited until today. But the part where everybody lives, the part where all of the uh, uh, the vast majority of the population and the conflict is taking place, is in this part that you can see in the map here, everything north of uh, Bir Saba or Beersheba. And in that part, uh, the private land owned by Palestinians was 89.5%, and the land owned by Jews was... 10.5%. Now, today, we have arrived not through purchases at a situation where the Israeli state, the Israeli government, owns something around 85 to 90% of that land. So how do you go from 90% of the ownership was for Palestinians to a world in which 90% of the ownership is owned by a government? It's not that it is owned by Jews. This is a very important distinction that we need to keep in mind. Most of the land that is under the sovereignty of the Israeli government is owned by the Israeli government, by the Israeli Land Administration, which owns about 93%. So this, I think, puts a very different spin on the speech that Yaren gave us about this being a society that is there to enhance human freedom and this being a moral society and this being a better society. I presume Yaren would not be a fan of uh, the U.S. government owning more than 90% of the land of the U.S. I presume he would oppose that kind of uh, policy pretty much anywhere. I believe the kind of mass confiscation that the government of Israel did at its inception by expelling hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and taking their homes, which Yaren, uh, is in, in, in one of his other mistakes, calls it uh, people just leaving voluntarily, which is ridiculous, as we're going to get to in a bit. The land was um, ethnically cleansed, and people were threatened at gunpoint to leave. I know this because people from my family experienced this. I am Palestinian myself. It is very well known. I know many, many, many people I've met throughout my life who have experienced this. Palestinian historians have documented this meticulously. Israeli historians have documented this meticulously as well. There is no conceivable way that any sane person could imagine that this fantastic scenario wherein 800,000 people, and not 600,000 as Yaren said, 800 to 1 million people left their homes out of their own volition just and because their own military, supposedly, the Arab military, not their own, of course, the militaries of Arab countries, told them to leave, which would be completely um, nonsensical, and there's absolutely no evidence for it. The way that it happened is through mass murder. And the reason that that happened was because the British mandate, the British government decided to give up Palestine from its owners, the people who own the property. And of course, uh, it's it's a beautiful irony, and Aaron really walked into my trap by beginning his uh, segment by talking about the importance of property rights, because this is exactly um, the, the issue here, that the property of the land of Palestine is not some abstract idea that gets given to nations based on um, what some people believe some god in the sky tells them. Property is owned by individuals, and the property and the land of Palestine was predominantly owned by people who were not Jewish. For hundreds of years, this was the case. Jews lived there. They could own property. Before 1948, Jews could buy property, which is more than can be said about non-Jews today. Non-Jews today cannot buy part of this land from the Israeli government, which owns all of the land and only allocates it to people who are from the who identify as Jewish. So how did they manage to go from owning 
from basically a, an ethnic group that individually, privately, and through private organizations owned 9.5% of the land or 10.5% of the land to owning 90% of the land. How did that happen? It was through the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And this is extremely well documented. The British decided because of their own calculations during World War I, they needed to get the Americans into the war. And the way that they could get the Americans into the war was to try and appeal to American Zionists who had an, uh, the, this kind of uh, romantic religious image of needing to rebuild the promised land. And of course, they wanted to appeal to anti-Semites in Britain and in America and across Europe who wanted to get rid of Jews. And so they offered this to get the US into the war. They offered this as a gift to the Rothschild family which was uh, uh, one of the leading uh, movers in the Zionist movement. So this is anything but organic. This isn't real land property. This isn't any kind of nation formed from people who own land getting together in court and uh, peacefully deciding to uh, establish a government. This is a, a bunch of Europeans who decided to establish a government by robbing the land of people they knew owned that land. It was very well known to all of those people that this land was predominantly owned by Palestinians. And the vast majority of Palestinians at that time were non-Jewish. About 95% were non-Jewish. And so the notion that you could just get 95% of the population to agree to live in a land in which they are treated as second-class citizens because the state doesn't belong to them, is, of course, fantastical. It is not realistic. The British had an agenda to build that land. From the Balfour Declaration, they were committed to it. There were a lot of British in the, in the government. They allowed the uh, Zionist immigrants to build a military while disarming the Palestinians during the 1930s. And this is, of course, um, something that Yaron, uh, 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 another one of the mistakes he made, he said the British mostly stood to the side as the Arabs tried to kill the Israelis, which is, of course, nonsensical. What happened was that the British from 1917 announced that they had a policy that they wanted to establish a Jewish homeland. And so all of the political representation that was established during that period for the local population was predominantly by the British for the Jews to be able to build a Jewish state and not for the Palestinians. And they allowed them to build a military and they disarmed the Palestinians in what was the biggest rebellion against a colonial power during the interwar years. The biggest rebellion against colonial powers lasted from 1936 to 1939. This is the first intifada. And it wasn't even against the Israelis. It was against, <clears throat> excuse me, it was against the British. And that, um, th that, uh, was crushed by the British and left the Palestinians disarmed. And while the British, while the Zionists joined with the British in fighting the Palestinians, and of course were allowed to continue to arm themselves by the British who wanted to build this fiat state. It's truly a fiat state. It's not a state that emerged out of the uh, private ownership of land. Uh, this is extremely well documented in the work of Ilan Pape, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. He brings it with Israeli documents, and um, but also, of course, Palestinians like Walid Khalidi have documented this extensively. And the notion that this was a peaceful exit, that people just left, is completely ridiculous. These people didn't just leave. These people were uh, under a systematic plan that's documented very well in that book, The Ethnic Cleansing in Palestine, which I highly recommend reading. You can find a free PDF on library genesis if you want. And in that book, Ilan Pape shows how there was a plan called Plan Dalet, which had been in um, brewing since the 1930s for how we're going to be, um, how we're going to kick these people out of their homes, and how we're going to systematically go to the most strategically important villages, murder people, and then tell all the surrounding villages that this is going to be your fate if you don't submit, if you, if, if you don't leave. And they did that to the Palestinian cities as well. They did it in Yaffa. They did it in Haifa. My own wife's family uh, were shelled in Yaffa in order to leave. And after they left, the entire city, the Palestinian part of the city, was destroyed. And this was a city that was a, a major city in Palestine before uh, Israel was created. It was completely, or for the most part, it was destroyed. Here's a small video from a... Um, from a uh, from some of these Israeli soldiers who participated in 1948 in the massacres that they committed against um, uh, a village called Tantura. And here's an Israeli soldier talking about it. Yeah. 
זה גם אנשים היו יכולים לבושות ויפה, ובאמת היה כבר... I'm going to read the uh, subtitle since it's in Hebrew so we can read the English. He's saying that this village was a very rich village. It looked like the people there were Europeans. People looked so nice. We went in. They're just laughing about raping a 16-year-old. They're laughing about how they put the Palestinians in cage and they gathered them and then they shot them. They're talking about how they used uh, uh, flamethrowers to burn them alive. And these were the stories that were uh, uh, popularized across all of these places, across all of these villages to tell people about what was going to happen to them. Of course, Israeli mythology uh, nationalist historiography would have you believe this is all uh, fabricated, but the Israelis themselves admit it. And they make an extremely fantastical case that the Palestinians somehow left and the Israelis just, you know, they were just, the, as the first Israeli president, Chaim Weizmann, happened, that a miracle happened and they left. You know, it's just 800 to 1 million people decided to just give up on their homes and leave. And the fact that you had these mass murderers running around shooting them and raping them and murdering them, uh, you are supposed to believe that this was completely irrelevant to their decision. Um, of course, this is completely ridiculous. Um, the idea that it was the Arab military that told Palestinians to leave is a complete fabrication. There is absolutely not a single shred of evidence that exists to support this. A Palestinian historian named Walid Khalidi wrote a paper in 1959 where he went through a recording of every single radio address made by the Arab radio stations that could go to Palestine because the BBC used to record all of that. He went through it all. He didn't see a single call for by Arab leadership for them to leave. There isn't a, a single politician, single uh, military general, single radio station, single newspaper that has at one once said any of this stuff. It's never happened. It's never been uh, mentioned. And um, Israelis just insist that the Arab armies were the, one, the reason that those people left. But that's completely, completely baseless and nonsensical. And the evidence, of course, is in what has happened next. Well, after the establishment of Israel... Israel has continued to deny those people their right to return to their homes. But not only that, some of these people are still citizens in Israel, and they are not allowed to return to their homes. So it was in, it was in a big part of it was the land grab. Some of the, some of these people became internal refugees. They went to live in the major cities, but they can't go back to their land. And they've tried to go back to their land, and they get shot at, and they get murdered if they go to back to their lands, or if they try and construct anything on that land, it gets destroyed. And they're not allowed to do it. And that land then gets allocated to Jewish migrants from anywhere around the world, anybody who comes in and claims to be Jewish and wants to join this massive land theft operation. Effectively, we still don't have a free market in land. Palestinians, anybody who's not Jewish is not allowed to own any of the vast majority of the land. The land is all owned by the government, and the government only assigns it to people who are Israeli citizens or Jews. And the only way to get that is to be Jewish. So this is hilarious that he would choose to begin his diatribe by talking about uh, property rights, and how Israel respects property rights. And I'd like to challenge him to tell me how I can buy my grandfather's land that was taken in Israel, even if I assumed I wanted to get it over all of the historical stuff and you know, let's just move forward. Name your price. Find me a way that I could become an owner of my grandfather's land, in, uh, which is now under Israeli uh, sovereignty. Of course, you can't. It is, and, uh, it, this is just the nature of Israel. The clear, The key thing that is the cause of this conflict is that Israel is an ethnicity-based socialist government monopoly land agency with a military that steals land for it. This is it. This is what the cause of the problem is. In Yaren's a fantastic formulation of the conflict, he just, at some point, he stops and he says, oh, well, you know, Israelis are so great. And then the Arabs, they have been cursed by being uh, ruled by some horrible leaders. And because of that, they just refuse to make peace and they continue to be irrational. Of course, he skips over all the whole part where... Um, any kind of responsibility for the actions uh, of the Palestinians could be explained by as a reaction to what the Israelis did. It's it's an incredible ability to just completely not be able to find any fault and just play the victim unconditionally. Because you know, so what? We took eight hundred thousand people's homes and we kicked them out and we ruined their lives and their communities, but magically they just aren't very fond of us for some strange reason. Since 1948, Palestinians can't go back to the land. They can't buy land. And of course, 
Since 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza. And since then, it's been con confiscating as much land as it can. It's confiscated probably around half of the West Bank so far, probably a little bit more. Land confiscations have continued. And as a result, the West Bank is divided into 250 open air prisons surrounded by Israeli military checkpoints where Palestinians can't move, where Palestinians are separated from their essential water and their essential lands, where Palestinians are prevented from trading from one another. And it's just an entire system for allowing the land to be stolen from the Palestinians to Jews simply for being Jews. And of course, this is why today we live in a world in which Israel remains the only state, as far as I can tell, not to declare its own borders. Why, I would like to ask Yaron, why is it that Israel does not declare its borders? It has never declared its borders because Israel was started by a fanatical religious fundamentalists who believe in divine right to take other people's land. And their plan is to take as much land as possible. And that's why they continue to refuse to define their borders. And they, because if they would define their borders, then what are they going to do about people in the West Bank and Gaza? Do you say that this is part of Israel? Well, then you're not. Why aren't you giving those people citizenship? Well, the answer is that it's because they are from the wrong tribe, wrong religion, wrong race. But you're not really supposed to be saying that. So you could also leave the West Bank and Gaza and say, all right, well, we don't want to rule over those people. We don't want to be the government of those people. We don't want to be part of them. This is a different nation. And then you just leave and you draw your borders away from that. But of course, Israel does not do that either. And so here we see the root of the conflict. And I would like to ask Aaron, what would happen if something like this were to happen in the United States of America? You're always criticizing governments, um, and you 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 lean libertarian. You're an objectivist. You're a Randian. You find all kinds of faults with the, the ways in which governments restrict human freedom all the time. Now I'm wondering what would happen if somebody in the U.S. ran on a political platform of "Let's do to American land exactly what Israel has done to uh, the land of Palestinians," and all you know it could be for say blacks or French Americans or German Americans, some kind of minority, 10% of America or 5% of America. Let's have a nation state for them because of America, because somebody has an old book that says we should do that. And we should just get over, everybody else should get over their property rights. And we are going to just have this system of land ownership, which is going to take away people's property rights, kick them out of their homes. And of course, oh, one other aspect that, that I didn't mention, of course, is the house demolitions. More than 130,000 houses have been demolished by Israel during this time and all the land theft. And so we see that if you try to apply all of these uh, ideals, if you try to bring the Israeli government to the U.S., I wonder what somebody like Yaron, who's also an American as far as I know, would uh, feel like. Of course, he wouldn't support these ideas, and yet I'm supposed to support them in Palestine and then get lectured sanctimoniously by him about how you are being dispossessed okay. and having your property stolen by people who are more moral than you Thank and better than you and why it's all your fault. Thank you, Safe. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. We want you to join us for two days of discussions and debate, which is all happening at the inaugural Dissident Dialogues 2024. This incredible event will take place in Brooklyn on May the 3rd and 4th. 
You'll be joining leading thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, Ian Hersey Ali, John McWalter, Aisha Akambi, Michael Schellenberger, Mary Harrington, Chris Williamson, Winston Marshall, Constantin Kissin, Francis Foster, and more. Hang on a second, since when have you ever been a serious thinker? I love thinking, it's my favourite hobby. Sometimes, of an evening, it's all I do, think. Moving swiftly on, we want you to join us for a gathering where everyone is part of the conversation. Conservatives, progressives, atheists, theists, left, right, and everything in between. Dissident Dialogues presents a rare opportunity to immerse yourself in a conversation with the most influential thinkers of our time. We'll tackle important topics relating to religion, science, politics, and culture. If you're driven by intellectual honesty, curiosity, and a desire for the truth, Dissident Dialogues is the place for you. It's not just an event, it's the beginning of an intellectual journey. And we want you to come along for the ride. I like rides. Dissident Dialogues is a place for dangerous ideas. Buy your tickets now at dissidentdialogues.org and be part of the conversation. Um, about 20 seconds over there. So to try to be the impartial moderator um we talked about doing a two minute response each on this first question so yaron if you want to take two minutes and 20 seconds uh if you guys want to add more that's fine as well there was a lot to unpack there so um we'll start with two minutes and go from there yaron over to you all right uh yeah two minutes is absurd because you know basically i disagree with everything that was said and i think it's it's fabricated um uh, fabricated history is what we just heard if you want to um, go over I, yaron and answer the points if safe's okay with it we'll just give him the yeah, same amount of time yeah I, sure i just want to i want to i want to uh cite uh just elan papier has been brought up uh he is a source of much of this um uh anti-history uh and let me just read you elan papier in his introduction to a history of modern palestine this is what he writes this is postmodern history my bias is apparent, despite my the desire of my peers, that I stick to facts and their truth, in quotes, when reconstructing past realities. I view any such construction as vain and presumptuous. This book is written by one who admits compassion for the colonized, not the colonizer, who sympathizes with the occupied, not the occupiers. Okay, so here's an historian in the introduction, admits he's biased, and then goes on to write a book that reflects the bias. Almost every historian, at least, Israeli historian, um, even some of the uh, new historians who uh, Ilan Pape claims to be part of have uh, rejected Ilan Pape's history and rejected uh, his idea. The same thing with the documentary that was shown. I mean, it really is, uh, uh, really is horrific. Um, uh, this documentary has been refuted over and over and over again. If uh, safe wants references, happy to provide the references to the people who refuted this. Uh, uh, the, 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 the whole, you know, this idea that there's no, uh, there's no evidence of, uh, Arab leaders. I recommend a book. It's called Palestine Betrayed by, uh, if I'm Kosh, uh, which has reams of documents about the fact that Arab leaders encouraged, uh, encouraged Arab population, particularly in Haifa to leave. Uh, it also includes, uh, posters and pamphlets that the Israelis distributed to Jews distributed among the Arabs, really asking them to stay and 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 stick around. And uh, they left in spite of all of that. Uh, this idea that uh, they were expelled is bogus. Again, about 10 to 15 percent of Palestinians were expelled for strategic reasons. All the others left, left because they were afraid, left because they didn't want to fight, left because they were told to leave, left for a variety of different reasons. They left, they abandoned their property at a time of war. They never changed their mind about the fact that they instigated the war and they wanted to kill all the Jews around them. And in, in my view, if a view of, of the perspective of rights, they forfeited their right to that land by initiating force. Initiation of force has consequences. When you initiate force, you lose, uh, you know, you lose, uh, you lose your rights. Um, you know, uh, uh, Safe says something about, uh, you know, what if this happened in America? 
<laughs> it's kind of funny, but 75% of the land west of the Mississippi, 75% of the land west of the Mississippi is owned by the government. Um, it, it, that is not unusual. Uh, now, I condemn Israel. Here's, here's me condemning Israel. I, I'm curious to see if SAFE condemns Palestinians and anything. I condemn Israel for owning 90% of the, of the land. That land should all be auctioned off. It should be privatized. Every last centimeter of it should be in private hands. I do not believe in government ownership of any land, of any property. Uh, government should not own anything. Uh, it should have a military, a police force, and a judiciary. And other than that, it should leave people alone. Uh, so yes, that, gov gov that land should all be privatized. But the idea that Arabs can't buy land in Israel is, again, ludicrous. If you travel around Israel and you look at uh, Arab villages and Arab towns, they have grown tr tremendously. More Arabs live in single-family homes in Israel than Jews do as a percentage of the population. They've expanded dramatically. They've expanded dramatically because they've been able to purchase land from uh, Jews purchased it. They've been given land from the government uh, to expand, and some of it was owned by Arab population uh, in the place. Houses are demolished. I condemn house demolition. But the reality is that if a Jew builds a house without getting a permit, sadly, you need permits, even in the United States. If you, say, build a house in the United States without getting a permit, the government will come in and demolish it. Now, I condemn that in the U.S., I condemn it in Israel, but let's not pretend that this is some uh, discriminatory act. This is true of Jews, and this is true of Arabs. If I build a house in, in Haifa, where I'm from, uh, on, on, um, uh, that I did not get a permit from, that house would be demolished. Now, it happens that, you know, Arabs do it more often than Jews, so their houses are condemned more often. But yes, it, you know, it's, it's wrong. To the extent that the government of Israel takes land, privately owned land, from Arabs or Jews. It is wrong, and uh, the courts have often reversed those things, but that happens in America too. It's called eminent domain. I'm against it. I reject eminent domain, but the idea that Israel is special here, that Israel does it in a particularly bad way, I think is absolutely wrong. 1936-39 war against the British. Um, you want me to stop, or...? No, I was just saying it's a five-minute mark. Um, again, okay, I'll just we, say we, this. And, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'll just say this, and then and then uh, we can. 1936-39 war was a rebellion against the British, although uh, they threw in the killing of Jews as much as they could uh, during that period, and a significant number of Jews were murdered. Again, this is after 1929 and 1920 and 1921, so this is the, oh, not the only one. But what's interesting about the 36-39 war, and again, this goes to the point of the the betrayal of the Palestinians by their own leaders, is in 36, 39, the Arabs spent more time killing each other. More time for uh, Husseini, who, again, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a Nazi, killing his opponents than killing a British uh, or Jews. Arabs killed more Arabs during that uprising than they killed British or they killed Jews. And this is part of their uh, the challenge that they've always had, is that the worst elements within them rise up and take control, even at the expense of killing their opponents. All right, I, there's a lot more to say about the property rights claims, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Yaron. Uh, that was right at the six minute, 15 second mark. So safe if you wanna give uh, an equal timed response, uh, I think that would be fair. So over to you. Yeah, I think the the, the notion that it is uh, that the Palestinians left is just a complete fabrication that has absolutely no shred of evidence for it. And uh, Yaron just continues to present this completely nonsensical version, wherein these you know you you know that um, song by Shaggy, "It Wasn't Me," or that um, uh, bit by I think it was Richard Pryor, the comedian who did, who did the same bit. Basically, it doesn't matter whatever evidence that comes along, you're just incapable of admitting that there was a mistake on my side. So all of the evidence wherein she catches him and he just keeps saying it wasn't me. And it's the same thing. So we have the actual Israelis themselves saying how they mass murdered people. And Yaron just says, no, that's been debunked. Like what, did I just yes. make this up with AI? Are these people lying? Um, uh, 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 this is just a big number of Israelis over six, 75 years who have been lying about this. All the Palestinians who experienced this are also lying about it. All the documents we have about the Israelis uh, planning these military operations are all lying about it. And we're supposed to just believe that somehow 
this happened when there's absolutely no shred of evidence that it was the Arab leaders that told them to leave. But one big mistake that, um, and there are so many mistakes that I need to get to, but one very important one is that, notice Yaren, uh, uh, when he's talking about the Palestinians, he misses, he ignores the point that there was actually no Palestinian government out there that was in any way elected. So the entire thing was built on the dispossession of the Palestinians by the British, preventing them from having uh, their property or any kind of political representation. And so what we have is not a political entity where, you know, people voted for this government and then you can say, well, that government needs to hold this. No, we had a civilian population that lived in Palestine. And realistically, the majority of them, like every civilian population pretty much throughout history, was mostly concerned with their day-to-day -day things. And, and, and in many of these history stories, it's, it's sad how uh, hospitable Palestinians were to Jewish immigrants because they just could not imagine that really the British Empire and all of these migrants are um, collaborating and co conspiring to take away our land. It was just completely unimaginable. And they were just living their day-to-day -day life. And yet what Yaren is saying is essentially collective guilt. All of those people lose their right to property, this completely immoral thing that he says, where just people lose their right to property because armies of a country other than theirs declared war on a government other than theirs. So the Egyptian and Jordanian armies declare war and my grandparents who had never been to Jordan or Egypt before that point, maybe, are now just, you know, you lose all of your property. Right? Well, they weren't any part of any of that stuff. So the entire thing, when he, when he talks about property rights, he ignores the fact that the entire thing is predicated on identity politics. It's just some people get to own property and some people don't. Yes, Palestinians still own some property in Israel, but 93% of the land is owned by the Israeli Land Administration. You can check the sources on that. You can check their website. About 93% of that land. They can't buy any of that. That is not even sold to Israelis. It is leased, and it is only leased to people who are Jewish. This is how it works. So yeah, on the, the rest of the land, there are parts that are still owned by Palestinians and they can still buy and sell it uh, to one another. But this is not uh, the majority of the land. And in fact, more and more of the land is going towards that. And this is the key thing. He says, well, no, you know, he's trying to compare this to eminent domain in the US and he's trying to talk about licenses. No, this is very uniquely evil and different in the case of Israel. You know why? There is no religious quota and there are no religious considerations for zoning laws yes zoning laws in the u.s suck but imagine if zoning laws in the u.s just treated jewish americans the same way that we treat the jewish uh, israelis treat palestinians the point is it happens to be the, it doesn't just happen to be more uh, demolitions of palestinian homes it isn't just because palestinians don't get permits it's because israel does not give them permits and i know this because i've seen many people whose lives have been ruined because this government does not give them the permits they need to build on their own land and settlers move into the land and then the land is stolen and then when the land is stolen then it's just gone forever and it's never it can never be bought again you look at sheikh jarrah store a few months a couple of years ago the last major uh, uh, conflagration that happened was over sheikh jarrah and remember at uh, that point there's uh, there's that famous video of the um, Israeli settler, American settler, I should say, some dude, some fat dude from Brooklyn who showed up at a Palestinian family's home and uh, told them to leave because the court was about to kick them out from their home anyway, because they're not Jewish. And they told him, look, this is our home. You're stealing our house. You can't steal our house. And he said, if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. This is the reality of the matter. Anyone from Brooklyn can go back, can go, not back, no back there. Anyone from Brooklyn can go to Palestine claim to be Jewish, get a piece of land from a Palestinian family that has been living on that land for hundreds of years who are getting kicked out of it because of some bureaucraties bullshit that is being manufactured. And of course, here we get into our canes of the law and we don't have time to get into them, but throughout the entire thing you see very systematically, Palestinians in Jerusalem don't get the right to build homes. They don't get the right to expand their land. They don't have the right to buy more land. In fact, if they simply leave, if they go and spend a year in the U.S. to study for college and they don't come back for a certain amount of days, they lose their right to enter Jerusalem. They would lose their uh, Jerusalem IDs and then they can never go back to visit their families again and they need to go and find another home. It's an entire 
insane system that has been designed in order to get as many Palestinians out of the land as possible and to get as much land in the hands of the government as possible. This is what it comes down to. And so, of course, Yaron says, yeah, he's for the privatization of the land. Well, if you're for the privatization of the land, are you also for people who are not Jewish being able to own that land? And what happens if just through the forces of the market, a majority of the people who end up buying land end up being not Jewish? What are we going to do then? This is the entire Zionist project. The entire Zionist project is trying to continue to um, create more violent conflict, to kick more Palestinians out, to ensure that more land is in the hand of the government. All right. Um, moving on to the second question. This will go to you again first, Yaron. Question is, what is the nature of and origin of Zionism? And how does it play into this conflict? You'll have 15 minutes for your answer, and then we'll do five-minute responses for each. Right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> before before I get to the issue of Zionism, I, I, the, the, I, I feel like there's still stuff that has to be said about the previous question. Uh, let me say that quickly within my 15 minutes, because uh, I think I have less to say about Zionism. Um, there are no documents showing and proving Israel's intent to create massacres or to even expel Arabs. Just none, they don't exist. Um, it, it, the uh, Arab uh, leaving cities like Haifa, by the time May arrives and, is, and the Arab armies invade, Haifa has no Arabs in it. 90% uh, of the Arabs have already left. So uh, it's, not the, it's not the consequence of the Arab armies, it's a consequence of the initiation of force the initiation of violence by the Arab population of Haifa against the Jewish population, which was literally begging them not to do it and to stay, uh, that caused uh, the Arabs to leave uh, to leave Haifa, um, and and that is true in in many of the other cities and towns uh, around Israel. I mean, it's just the history that Safe, unfortunately, is presenting has been debunked and refuted uh, in, in a variety of places. Much of it was created by pseudo-historians like Ilan Pape, who make it up and admit to making it up because they have a bias and they have an agenda and they have a, and they have a goal here. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's very difficult to talk about something like Zionism in the context in which, um, you know, the history is so, the extent of the history is so, uh, misrepresented. And uh, let me just, one last thing. The thing that upsets me most about the misrepresentation is the misrepresentation of the situation in Israel today, which I know firsthand. Um, I used to work in the construction Israel in industry in Israel. The idea that Arabs cannot lease land, buy land from the government is absurd and simply wrong. It just is not true. Uh, they do all the time. They build, uh, they build in their villages, they build in their town, they build in Jewish neighborhoods. They own land in Jewish neighborhoods. And it's not just land they buy from other private owners, they get it from the government. The government does not, does not systematically discriminate against Arab land owners or, or, or Arab land owners or Arab land uh, contractors. Indeed, one of the great things about Israel is it is a place in which the Arabs are free, indeed freer than any other place in the Middle East, freer than any other country um, that is governed by, uh, by Arabs themselves. Zionism. Look, uh, Zionism, in my view, um, is a what is called a package deal. It has good elements and lots of bad elements. I'm not a Zionist in the sense of this is an ideology I support and I defend. I don't. It has unquestionably certain religious, um, but more importantly, it has certain uh, tribalistic and collectivistic elements to it, which I reject. However, it does have some aspects that are good and true. And in the world in which we live, a pretty, uh, a pretty um, shitty world, a pretty bad world, from the perspective of individual rights and individual freedom, uh, Zionism has one element which I think uh, is legitimate, and I think it's the element that animated Herzl. Herzl is the founder of the Zionist movement, was not religious, he was not a collectivist, he was not a tribalist. Herzl was born Jewish and attempted through most of his life to assimilate into European society. As a journalist 
in uh, representing an Austrian newspaper in France, he witnessed the Dreyfus trial, and he came to a very simple conclusion. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Dreyfus trial, Dreyfus was a colonel, I think, in the French military, accused of spying for the Germans. He was Jewish, and it was clear that the whole thing was was uh, an anti-Semitic trope. The whole thing was uh, was going after Dreyfus because he was a Jew and had nothing to do with any factual basis for his spying. And he was con uh, Herzl came to the conclusion the Jews that anti-Semitism was endemic. The Jews had no future in Europe, indeed, that they would be exterminated if they stayed, something that turned out to be very true. Um, that even Jews who did not consider themselves Jews, like him at the time and me, would be identified as Jews by others and therefore exterminated. Hitler did exactly that. Didn't matter if you considered yourself a Jew or not, you were exterminated. And therefore, Herzl's project was a project of self-defense. His view was the only way for Jews, people who were identified as Jews by the world, to survive was to establish their own state. Not because he thought that was ideal. He would have loved to stay in Europe. He was a European. He loved Europe. But because otherwise, they would be killed. Zionism was, in Herzl's mind, a project of self-defense. And this is why... For a very long time, he considered South America as a place where maybe Jews could start a state. He even voted to have a Jewish state in Uganda when the British suggested it. Maybe we could do it in Uganda, give you a piece of land over there. He was not necessarily attached to uh, any particular geographic location. What he wanted was to get out of Europe. What he wanted was for the Jews to form a group, not because he believed in group, but because the only way to defend the individual was to be in a group because of the collectivism that was rampant in Europe and the rest of the world. I think Herzl was shown to be correct in the sense that anti-Semitism rears its ugly head constantly and everywhere. It is one of the real evils uh, that exists out there in the world. And whether you are you recognize yourself as a Jew or not, is irrelevant. The world identifies you as such. And therefore, you need to find a way to protect yourself. And in an era where basically every avenue to escape Europe was blocked, the, uh, in 1921, the United States blocked immigration of Jews into the United States, all Europeans, but Jews among them, into the United States. From 1921 onward, the number of Jews emigrating into the United States plummeted, literally plummeted. Um, in uh, the UK, refused Jewish immigrants. The United States in, in the 1930s, with Hitler in power, refused to take a boat of refugees from Europe uh, filled with Jews and return them back to Europe to be killed in the concentration camps. After World War II, after the camps were liberated, Auschwitz and others, there were 200,000 Jews who had no home, couldn't go back to Poland because the Poles would kill them, couldn't go back to Russia because the Russians didn't want them, had no place to go. They wanted to come to the U.S. Truman wanted to let them in as refugees. Congress voted against it. In, uh, uh, you know, the dream of South America, the dream of Uganda were, were ridiculous to start off with. They were never going to happen. So Jews decided to emigrate to Palestine. They emigrated. In spite of what Saif did, he never presented any evidence to suggest that before 1948, Jews did not purchase all the land that they, and I've seen him actually acknowledge this fact in another interview, that Jews purchased the land. They came in as immigrants. I think we all believe in freedom. Freedom of immigration should be part of that. They came in as immigrants. They weren't bringing in weapons. They didn't declare that they wanted to kill all the Arabs there. Indeed, exactly the opposite. They wanted to live with the Arab population there. They came in, and again, they bought land, they settled it, they built farms, they built communities. Some of them were socialists, some of them were not. They built factories, they built industry, they built utilities, they created a civilization. They built cities. Uh, Tel Aviv was a city they built out of nothing, not by confiscating anybody's land. So uh, Zionism as a project was a project of self-defense. Now, were there elements within the Zionist movement? Are there elements today within the Zionist movement who um, make a big deal out of religion? 
sure. I think it's horrible. Are there elements within it that are, you know, nationalist zealots? Sure. I think it's horrible. But the fundamental project is a project of self-defense and a project that is legitimate, particularly given, particularly given the kind of country they wanted to found, the kind of state they wanted to create. The state was going to be a state in which all citizens were treated equally. Ben Guyon writes about this over and over and over again. Herzl writes about this over and over and over again. Jabotinsky of the right, the nationalist right, writes about it and actually forms a, 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 a constitution for the future state in which everybody has equal rights, in which Arabs are part of the part of government and own land and all of that, which is true to the kind of state they found it. Again, not a good state. I don't live in Israel. One of the reasons I don't live there is because it's too socialist, it's too collectivistic, it's too a lot of things. But in comparison to every other state on the planet Earth, it's about as good as it gets. And in respect to the fundamental liberties that individuals have, it respects them, no matter what their religion is. I've spent time, again, uh, uh, in Arab villages uh, in Israel. I'm not talking about the West Bank and Gaza. We can talk about those if you want. And it's just untrue the way SAFE describes it. It's just not real. As I said before, uh, when we talked about doctors, when we talked about engineers, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, it, it, you know members of members of the parliament, if Israel wanted to actually crush and eliminate the Arab population in Israel, it could have done so a long time ago. It could have done so quite effectively. It could have denied them political any kind of political rights. It could have done a lot of things which it did not do. So ultimately, the project is a project of self-defense. Um, it's a project that basically has at its core the idea that Jews should be allowed to immigrate uh, and, and will never be barred from immigration. I, for one, hope that the day will come where others are also allowed to immigrate into Israel. I'm a generally a pro-immigration uh, person or pro-open immigration. Uh, but you don't allow into your country people who are committed to your own destruction. And the reality is that the Palestinian people are committed to Israel's destruction still to this day. At least the organizations that represent them or such. Um, so uh, Zionism, if you look at the actual documents over and over and over again, emphasize the fact that the state that they will build in Israel is a state that has equal rights. Some were more socialist, some were more free market types. Yamatinsky was a more free market type. Ben Gurion was more of a socialist type. But generally, they all respected the rights of individuals and believed that those rights, um, that they would grant those rights uh, to the Palestinians uh, and, and to the Arabs, and not just uh, to the Jews. I, I let me just end with this. I think it's I think it's sad that one there was a need for Zionism. I, I wish we lived in a world in which you didn't need Zionism. I wish we lived in a world in where collectivism didn't exist and tribalism didn't exist and anti-Semitism didn't exist. But it does. <laughs> we, we can wish for a different world, but it does. It exists. And given that world, the Zionists built about as good of a state as you could imagine. They treated their Arab neighbors about as well as anybody has ever treated neighbors. And uh, they have conducted themselves about as good as one can conduct themselves in a crazy environment, in a crazy part of the world. Um, and, and, and this is not what you could say about, na about Arabs or about Arab nationalism. Remember, the Arab cause, the Palestinian cause, is a nationalistic, ethnocentric uh, cause, which is a uh, Arab land with Jews as second-class citizens. That is not something, given the history of anti-Semitism, uh, Jews can accept. And 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 just by the way, we, we haven't even I haven't mentioned this, but the fact that Jews were expelled from all these other Arab countries, Iraq, Morocco, Yemen, Egypt, Syria, they were all expelled. By the way, their property rights were not respected. Their property was taken from them. All their property was taken from them. 
um, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Arabs were of uh, of Jews were expelled from Arab countries, uh, and they were not. They, their property was taken, uh, and some of them went to Israel, some of them went to Europe, but they were all expelled. Suggest kind of the the um, growing anti-Semitism in the Arab world, and the unwillingness to uh, to live together in any kind of uh, respectful uh, kind of environment. So. Uh, the Arabs are dedicated to, unfortunately, uh, a, a ethnocentric, anti-Jewish, um, uh, with no Jews, uh, solution to this. It's in the Hamas Charter. It's in the PLO. It was in the PLO Charter. Uh, it 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 is always they want the Jews out. They want their destruction. They want their murder. Um, that has never been the intention of the Zionists. I don't know how much time it was. I lost. I lost track of the time. Nope. Thank you, Yaron. That was right on time. Okay. Um, okay. Safety. I will throw it over to you for fifteen minutes. What is the nature and origin of Zionism, and how does it play into this conflict? I think the most essential thing to understand about Zionism and Palestine is that Zionism is alien to Palestine. This is a really important fact. Before Zionism as a political movement at the end of the 19th century, there were already Jews living in Palestine and they had property rights and they could own land. In fact, and this is a fact that is uh, rarely ever mentioned by anybody, the as I'm sure most of your listeners will know, most of the Jews were expelled or the Jews were expelled from Palestine by the Romans and uh, that was around AD 70 or so. And since then, there were no Jews in Palestine until the Islamic conquest of Palestine in 637. After which point, uh, Omar, the second caliph in uh, the second Khalifa or caliph in Islam, went to Jerusalem and figured out the, and had Jews from Arabia come with him to figure out the location of the temple. And the, it was turned into a trash dump by the Romans, and they cleaned it, and they rebuilt. Uh, the, the, I mean, they didn't rebuild it, but they allowed Jews back in there to pray there, and they allowed them to rebuild the uh, center of Jerusalem. And since then, since from 637 until today, Muslims, Christians, and Jews have lived in Palestine. And this was always considered the normal state of affairs. And several Islamic states took over the land over the time. And at uh, the uh, end of this, toward the uh, end of the um, uh, Ottoman era, the last 400 years, you had the Ottomans. And during the Ottoman period, you had the system that allowed people to exist within their religion. So you could be Christian, Muslim, and uh, or Jewish, or uh, Druze, or any religious minority, and have your rights in your region, and be able to live by your own law. And so the notion of Jews living in Palestine is not something that is alien, but Zionism as a political movement is entirely alien. It is a product of the work of Eastern European socialists of the late 19th century. And if you're familiar with history, you are quite familiar with the sort of things that have been created by Eastern and Central European socialists of the, li of the late 19th century and the early 20th century. This is an ideology that was born out of that period of um, ethno-nationalism, where all of these notions of blood and soil were being formed, and the idea that people of, diff of same religions and races need to be uh, in separate states away from other people with their own flag and their own uh, um, national movement. And this was, of course, a very belligerent um, ideology, which led to all kinds of horrific conflicts in European history. But this was not the case in the Middle East. And this was not the case under his, um, Palestine, under the Islamic rule that was in Palestine. Effectively, Jews and Christians could live there. And um, Yaron mentioned the jizya. And of course, yes, the uh, Christians and Jews did pay jizya in these uh, situations, but the Muslims also had to pay taxes. So this was essentially tax. Of course, I am against it. I am against taxes. I don't think if I were uh, king, well, I wouldn't be king. I, I don't want to. But if I were, if it was up to me, I wouldn't want to have any taxes. 
but the, you know, Muslims pay taxes and Jews and Christians pay taxes. So this notion of an ethno state being built in Palestine for one ethnicity, this is something completely alien. And it is a product of Herzl, who was an Eastern European, looking around, watching, you know, German nationalism and Italian nationalism and Hungarian nationalism on all of these movements develop and thinking of doing something uh, similar for Jews. And essentially, um, the idea appealed to enough people that saw in it some kind of messianic vision because of the historical significance of the land. Um, but the reality is for, two th for 1,300 years, Jews could return to Palestine and they chose not to. So the issue was not that Jews were prevented from being from Palestine, in Palestine. The issue that this is a natural return to a homeland makes no sense because there are stories, I can share an interesting story I came across from the, from the 18th century of Polish Jews traveling to Palestine and um, talking about their interactions with the local population, the local Jews and the local Muslims and how things were friendly. And it was just completely normal for this to exist. And now it's been completely disrupted. So um, Herzl continues to frame this in the, uh, in, in the sense of anti-Semitism is always necessary. And this is just such a tragic, um, self-fulfilling prophecy almost, in a sense that the, the, the lack of self-awareness that Herzl presents, which is typical of nationalists who generally have this idea that, you know, my nation can do no wrong. And of course, all the others are evil. So for Herzl, the notion that we can just go and take other people's land and build a nation on a land that is predominantly not um, owned by people of the group that we want to use is somehow just a solution to the problems. And of course, it wasn't the first solution. It wasn't plan A. His plan A was assimilation. And eventually... And then this is really the key thing, I think, and about Zionism. Eventually, it, it was it, it, somebody asked Herzl, you know, what do you think will tempt the Jews of Vienna and um, I forget some specific areas in Europe? But, you know, why would the Jews who live in all of these places go to Palestine, which is a relatively backward place compared to those places? And he said, leave it to the anti Semites. It is, as Aaron says, it is a product of anti Semitism. But I think. Zionists underestimate the extent of its own anti-Semitism. It's not just that Zionism is a reaction to anti-Semitism. Zionism in itself is anti-Semitic in that it presents itself as a solution for the problem of Jews assimilating in their countries, when in reality, the majority of the world's Jews still aren't Israeli. I mean, for all of the bluster and all of the romanticism and all of the propaganda, and all of the subsidized housing, the fact that any Jew from anywhere in the world could just go and get my grandfather's land in Palestine by mere, I, merely identifying as Jewish. In spite of all of that, the world, majority of the world's Jews don't move to Israel. And the majority of the people under Israeli rule are close to being probably not Jewish. It's, it's difficult to estimate, and I think Gaza has probably swung the pendulum the other way, but it's around the same air, it's around the same kind of number. Israel rules over as many non-Jews as it rules over Jews, and the majority of the Jews are outside of Israel. So this entire thing is just an entirely artificial construct that makes no sense, and attempting to impose it by rich, powerful Western European countries because of their own dramas and their own history of anti-Semitism and their own um, beliefs about religion is constantly causing conflict. The issue here goes back to property rights. And Yaron says he's seen Arabs build homes and so therefore there is no issue. Well, again, I asked him a question. How is it possible for me to go back and own my grandfather's land, which was taken? And also, why isn't it possible for Palestinians who live in the West Bank in Gaza to own land in Israel, whereas it is possible for Israelis who live in Israel to buy up land in the West Bank, land that is stolen from Palestinians? I mean, you can continue to deny it, and um, uh, but the reality is, <laughs> I'm going to share the screen again, because this is worth hearing. This is 
exactly what it is. This is precisely what is going on. This is some guy who lives in Long Island and he's out of Brooklyn or something like that. And he's in Palestine, going into a Palestinian family's home and kicking them out and saying, look, it's going to happen anyway. You either going to somebody else is going to take your home or I'm going to take your home. We're going to take your home. And this has been life for Palestinians for the past 70 years. And Yaren can shake his head all he wants, but this is the reality for somebody who is Palestinian, for somebody who's lived in those places. This is what it is. It's a constant horror of they want to demolish your house because of some stupid rule or regulation. They want to confiscate your land because they want to build security zones or something or the other. All kinds of things that have been tried since 1967 that have resulted in the confiscation of more than 50, 60 percent of the land of the West Bank. And all of this stuff about Israel wanting to offer peace is all, of course, completely nonsensical and all the product of bullshit propaganda because it doesn't address the issue of land. They're saying that we're going to give the Palestinians a state and we made a peace offer. No, you're maintaining the majority of the land. You're maintaining control of the land. You're not allowing Palestinians to have property right in the rest of their land for no reason other than the fact that they have a wrong religion. And this is just something that is completely completely insane anywhere else in the world, except in Palestine, where it is considered okay. This government decides that people who don't have this religion get to only live in these little closed up areas. And then we wonder, why are they so anti-Israeli? Why do they hate Israel? Why do they want to destroy Israel? Their lives have been destroyed. They've been made into refugees. They've been kicked out. They can't build homes. They can't get on. This is the thing. People say, well, the Palestinians should just move on. It's not possible to move on because Israel won't declare its borders. Israel continues to confiscate land. Israel continues to steal homes. Israel continues to destroy communities and drive Palestinians out and therefore continues to engender conflict. The issue here for Yaren, it seems like it's some kind of um, you know scoring points for the sake of winning a debate that it is, you know, well, the laws are this and the laws are that. As if it's uh, property rights is just some kind of moral goodness competition that he's trying to win in the abstract. The reason we have this kind of moral code, the reason property rights matter is not uh, some holier than thou pissing contest. It's because this is the only framework that as a society, that as humanity, we have figured out for the large, for, for peaceful coexistence and large civilizational uh, societies. This is the only way that it works. We respect each other's property. And if we respect each other's property, we can stop living in the jungle as animals slinging our feces at each other and have nice things. And this is the problem. So how has this Israeli approach to property worked out? It's obviously a disaster. And how would it work out if you tried it anywhere? What would happen if you said that only, say, French people can migrate to the United States and that everybody else in the United States is going to either get killed as and you know the Israel current Israeli finance minister puts it, and he really is the one calling the shots at this point in in terms of Israel's policy. Palestinians have one of three short choices: die, leave, or live under Israeli control. You have to accept this idea of an Israeli state that is Jewish and which you are not a citizen, in which you don't have equal right, in which you don't have the right for property. Yaren says that Tel Aviv was built out of nothing. Yeah, but it was built by destroying Yaffa, which was a city that was already there. So there are all these, uh, this mythology of Zionist propaganda is this idea that Israel was, you know, this desolate land that was, got turned into um, a, a prosperous city. And so they show you that Tel Aviv was empty land. Yes, it was empty land, but there's empty land everywhere. There's empty land in every country in the world. And right next to it was a city. Most of that city has been destroyed by Zionist gangs that were uh, terrorizing it. And the terror, Zionist terror did not just extend to this. Um, there was also the hospital bombings, uh, the hotel bombings, King David hotel bombing, the assassination of all kinds of uh, figures, international figures. And all of this is just part of the same uh, pattern, which Zionists and Israel supporters completely refuse to see because they have a very cartoonish and very... A Hollywoodish idea of this kind of romantic thing that we went to this desert and we made it bloom. But you know what? In reality, what you're doing is just comparing 19th century technology to 20th century technology. It, it, Israel, it hasn't been this miracle. You know, we eliminated malaria. Well, you know what? Lebanon and Jordan don't have Israel and they don't have Zionism and they still manage to eliminate malaria. Um, the, the advancement of technology that happened happened across the region in a not very dissimilar way. This notion that uh, it was the Zionists that came, it completely ignores the fact that this was 
uh, the most transformative period technologically in human history. And the technology was coming anyway, regardless of who brought it. And of course, I accept, Rian mentioned that, yeah, I can see the point. Of course, I can see the point that they purchased the land up until 1948, but and up until 1947, but then in 1947 they began the mass expropriation. And some of it started even earlier, but in 1947 it started the mass expropriation of land violently, which is the vast majority of the land, which is where the refugees have been kicked out from, which is where the refugees want to return. And that's the only reason you managed to establish an Israeli state. And the Israeli leaders are very clear about it. This notion that there are no documents is nonsensical. Read about Plan Dalet. Uh, this is very well documented. They had a deliberate. They had. A, deliberate plans with extensive statistics on how many people were there in each village and which were the villages they needed to clean because there was a very clear understanding from the 1930s expressed by Ben Gurion and many Zionist leaders that we cannot keep a majority of the population that is not Jewish, so we need to drive out a large part of the population. We need to wait for some opportune event, is the exact quote from uh, uh, Ben Gurion. We need to wait for some opportune event and we can get them out. And they planned for it and they figured out where the people were living and they managed to kick out the people in the area to, to form a contiguous area in which they could have territorial contiguity across the land and they could take up most of the land and they ended up with an enormous amount of the land. So this notion that this is some kind of uh, peaceful, romantic, uh, uh, happy thing is completely nonsensical and arguably it has failed in its own vision, and it continues as just a horrific, horrific government intervention and a horrific government uh, catastrophe, like all kinds of government programs in the world, run thanks to central banking and fiat subsidies to governments all over the world that are emotionally blackmailed into doing this, and Thank not just you. emotionally blackmailed. Thank you, Safe. Um, okay, we'll do five-minute responses on this, since two minutes was not enough on the last question. And I will turn the first response over to you, Yaron. Where does one start? I, I, I'll say there is a plan D. Absolutely, there was a plan D. But it has nothing to do with what SAFE presents to this. It was a plan, a military plan, in the event that the Arabs attack Israel, what Israel will have to do, what villages were threats, and where they would have to deploy forces. Plan D existed. But the pretense of Plan B D being about expulsion of Arabs is fabrication. It's fabricated in history, um, as is much of what SAIF is presenting here today. The idea that uh, anti-Semitism was brought on by the Jews somehow. It's the Jews' fault is anti-Semitism. No, it, it, Hitler just, you know, just happened to do what he did. It was the Jews' fault that he did what he did. I mean, that's just beyond... Uh, anyway... Uh, it, it, it's beyond ridiculous. Uh, but uh, the reality is anti-Semitism is a reality if SAFE can't even acknowledge the existence of anti-Semitism and it, the extent of anti-Semitism. And the idea that Hutzel is a nationalist is absurd. Hutzel was nothing, anything like a nationalist when he started out. His only reason he turned to nationalism was because of his witnessing anti-Semitism firsthand. And by the way, the pogroms going on in Russia starting uh, in the early 19th century, really accelerating in the end of the 19th century. All of this was part of the reason why Herzl and ultimately others came around. I uh, remember that the, many of the founders of Israel were atheists. Uh, they, they, they did not believe in religion. They were not going to Israel because it was a holy land. They didn't believe in a holy land. Uh, what they believed in is a, trying to form a place where they could live in peace. Three of pogroms. Free of being harassed, free of being killed, free of being their property taken away from them. He says, nowhere else in the world does this happen. Well, what did the Arabs do to the Jews? They kicked them out and stole their property. They stole all their property. And here, it's clearly expulsion. Because nobody encouraged them to leave except the Arab governments that passed laws saying Jews could own property in the 19, late 1940s or early 1950s. They said Jews could not be citizens. And they kicked them out and stole their property. So the Arabs did it to the Jews. But of course, this happens all the time. 20 million people were kicked out of the Czech, of Czechoslovakia and Poland and sent to Germany without their property. Do any of those now demand their property back in Czech Republic and Poland? No, they don't. They've settled in Germany. They've, they've rebuilt their, they've rebuilt their, and why was this accepted by anybody? Because Germany started a brutal war and killed a lot of people. Um, and in this case, the Palestinians, the Palestinians in Haifa, in Jaffa, in Nazareth, in Tiberias, 
started attacking the Jews. The Jews defended themselves. And at the end, when the Jews won, the Palestinians left. And that is the reality. They left because they lost. They left because they didn't want to be under Jewish rule, maybe. They left because they were afraid, maybe. They left because they were promised that the Arab countries were going to come and liberate them, maybe. But they left. They weren't kicked out. They left. Uh, Zionism, I don't know, even know what Zionism is alien to, to, to Palestine. Uh, and, and I won't get into the history of uh, the Roman Empire, but there were always Jews there. They weren't in Jerusalem, but there were always Jews in Palestine, even before the Muslims arrived. Um, indeed, the Christians killed more Jews in Palestine when they did the Crusades than anybody else. But that's, I mean, that history is irrelevant. Um, uh, nothing about Husseini being a Nazi and wanting to exterminate the Jews. And maybe the Jews were a little worried that the Mufti of Jerusalem, who just affiliated itself with the Nazis, would now rule over a Palestinian state, ethnic state, by the way. The Arabs were very ethnically conscious. Talk about nationalism. The Arabs wanted an empire of Arabs. Nobody else. So there was clear uh, ethnic nationalism within the Arab states. So the idea that the Jews created this or anybody else created this is uh, is is insane. But the leader of the Palestinian movement in 1948, 1946, 47, 48, 49 was a Nazi who wanted to exterminate Jews. How would you feel if you were living there on property you had purchased, knowing that if there was one state ruled by Husseini, your life would be void. And by the way, property is only derived from the right to life, right? If we're dead, property is irrelevant. Thank you, Yaron. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Safe, for a five-minute response. Uh, first of all, when it comes to... Uh, I, I'm not sure how you imputed from what I said that it was uh, Jews who caused anti-Semitism. I never said that. I never implied that. What I was trying to say... I, I think you may be referring to that, was that this notion that this was going to be the solution to anti-Semitism is to just go and take other people's land and build a country was obviously nonsensical because if anything, it's going to create more problems. And this is what history has borne out, uh, 75 years of bloody conflict. You know the old saying, if you ran into an asshole, you ran into an asshole. But if you spend all your day and all your life for 75 years running into assholes, Perhaps it might be some time for introspection, and perhaps you might want to start considering some of these alternative theories that you keep presenting to all of these uh, bald-faced denials of reality of just 800 to 1 million people, 800,000 to 1 million people leaving, and it's just somehow insisting that all of this is legitimate, moral, and their fault. There is no such concept, this idea that um, uh, people lose their property right because random other people committed acts of violence. There was no trial that convicted anybody for uh, a crime and decided the punishment was to lose their property. This is this was done with maps through Plan Dalet, where they went through each village and figured out how much forces they need to get this village cleaned and how much they get people cleaned to get people to leave. And that's what they did across the country in order to get to secure this. The notion that you can just deny this and assume that, yeah, the, these people just left is completely nonsensical and the documentation is there. And the plans from people like Jabotinsky from the 1920s, he was very clear about the fact that, look, these people aren't going to like what we're going to be doing here and we need to be ready. And this is why the, pro the, the he called, you know, the, he, he's famous for creating this concept of the iron wall, that we need to always have, build settlements, have walls, and continuously expand and take more land from our enemies because we need to keep growing this. And of course, as part of Messianic Zionism, the land of Israel is a, a very fluid concept. They don't define their borders because it could well be argued that the land of Israel, as is mentioned in uh, some religious books, extends from the Nile to the Euphrates. And maybe that is the plan. I mean, why why wouldn't they just uh, declare their country's borders if that was not the case? But they continue to do it. Um, now, um, this notion that uh, people also lose their property because of Husseini. Nobody elected Husseini. Nobody made him leader. And it wasn't as if he was some kind of uh, legitimate representative or popular leader. There were many factions, but there was no effective political representation because, again, the British had worked from day one on disenfranchising the Palestinians in every way politically and in order to set up the institutions for a Jewish state rather than a Palestinian state, as they said. And as Balfour said in, the, in, in his declaration, you know, he said, 
uh, Zionism uh, is what we're here to do. But in a few years later, he wrote, uh, actually a few months later, he said, look, uh, the Zionism is what we're committed to, and Zionism is much more important than the uh, prejudices and um, opinions and facts and desires, I forget the exact quotation, of the local population. And when it comes to the issue of Arabs in Israel, incidentally, this is really rather curious. Don't you think when it comes to um, this story, you might want to ask yourself if the propaganda makes sense? Because here we have Iraq, Egypt, Syria, all these other countries where Jews had lived for as long as anybody can remember. And as you said yourself here, and they lived much better lives in those places than they did in Europe. And this is true. And in Baghdad and in, in Cairo, they had very good lives. And yet, what is it that happened that made them all leave after the establishment of Israel? What happened is that Israel needed people and Israel did everything it could to get them to leave. And that includes terrorist attacks in Cairo. They read about the Levon affair. And uh, the, the Levon affair, the perpetrators of the affair were awarded with government um, awards for their crimes in 2005, incidentally. They blew up uh, civilian areas in Egypt, and the plan was to make it known that it was the Jews of Egypt who are doing this so that people would turn against the Jews and the Jews would leave and come to Palestine. And the same thing happened in Iraq. Avi Schleim has documented this extensively. So this is what has really taken place. And I agree with you. I think for Jews should have the right to return to Arab countries. I think their property rights there should be accepted. I don't see why you continue to refuse that my wife can go back to her house in Haifa, in Yaffa, or I can go back to my grandfather's land. Why is it that we lose this? Uh, because of all of this, again, it's it, it's this very hyperbolic, Hollywoodish propaganda version of the conflict in which everyone is out to get us. These people were there. They've been living in that land for thousands of years. In fact, the Palestinians are most likely the closest genetic descendants to the original inhabitants of the land, including the Jews. So these people aren't picking a fight. They're not being anti-Semitic. They just want to stay in their homes, in their communities, and not get massacred and not get kicked out. Thank you, Saif. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, and even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, but it wasn't until I started working with a biohacker, Anthony D. Clementi, last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Um, okay, we're going to move 
to the next question, which is what is the role of money and central banking in this conflict? And we'll go first to you, Yaron. Do you mind starting with SAFE on this one? SAFE, any have any problem with that? That's up to SAFE. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. SAFE, uh, 10 minutes to you. So I think the uh, role of fiat money and central banking is extremely pivotal in this conflict. In fact, I think it is really the uh, originator of this conflict. I think one of the biggest misconceptions in our discussion, Robert, we spoke about this on your podcast. One of the biggest misconceptions people have about this is that it, it, this is some interminable religious conflict between Jews and Muslims and Christians in Palestine that has been going on forever and will continue forever and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And I think that's completely nonsense, because as we were saying, up until the Zionist project came about, Jews, Muslims, Palestinians, Christians uh, coexisted in uh, Palestine uh, largely, peacefully, almost entirely. Uh, very, very few cases of kind of inter-ethnic uh, conflict took place throughout uh, that period. Certainly nothing compared to what takes place in Europe. Then what happens? What happens is Europeans come up with the idea of modern ethno-nationalism, soil, blood, a group of people migrate to that land and we can't accommodate the local population. We need to get rid of them and we need to spirit them and we need to have an organization for acquiring land as much as possible and build this institution that continues to own until today 93%. I mean, this is the thing when you see, um, and to go back to Yaron's point, that this this is not some kind of accident that they just end up with all of this land owned by a government agency. This is the entire point from the beginning is more land and fewer Arabs. And we see it being played out in front of our eyes today. So what creates this is this European nationalism uh, finds rich benefactors in Britain at the time when Britain was fighting World War I and was overextended and needed the U.S. to enter the war. In the U.S., there were quite uh, significant Zionist influence, Christian Zionists as well as Jewish Zionists, who were influential in government and politics at that point and could probably sway bringing the U.S. into the war. And so part of the deal of uh, for Britain, part of the reason why they committed to this policy was because they wanted to get uh, the U.S. into the war. And that's why the Balfour Declaration was specifically given to Lord Rothschild. This isn't some coincidence, and this isn't some kind of um, uh, inconsequential affair. Britain was uh, was just uh, has just taken over Palestine. So Britain ran Palestine, and it just announced its intention that it was going to give this land to another, uh, to a population that only formed 5% of the population at that point. So effectively, they were saying, we're going to bring people from all over the world to go there. And specifically addressing it to the Rothschilds so that the Rothschilds could use their influence in the U.S. to bring in um, the U.S. into the war. And that's indeed what happened in World War I. And the same thing repeated in World War II. I think it was Chaim Wiseman uh, at that point who uh, secured from the British the fact that uh, from, from the British, the, uh, the fact that they would let the Zionists build a military in Palestine. That was while World War One was ha World War Two was happening, and that happened by um, promising to bring America into World War Two. And of course, central banking, which started around World War One, completely changed the face of politics, as I discuss in the fiat standard and in the Bitcoin standard. Under the Bitcoin, uh, under the gold standard, governments couldn't print gold, and so they could only fight to the extent that their gold reserves could sustain their war efforts. So we're very prudent about what they do with their uh, war spending. But then with fiat, governments can now fight until all of the value that is stored in all of the currency held by all of their citizens continue, uh, runs out. So that extends their runway for war much more considerably. And it also extends and increases their uh, estimation of the likelihood of their victory in this uh, war, and therefore increases their belligerence. And of course, also the fact that this money is can be printed whenever somebody comes up with some justification for a crisis is just a good reason to always continuously come up with stupid ideas for crises and ways to intervene. And we see this in all kinds of things. Governments are always coming up with stupid ideas for why they need to do stuff. And the reason this is so popular is because this means they get to print money. And of course, they benefit from that. And Zionism is one of these terrible ideas. It was uh, there, the British, who um, uh, started that with their uh, promise to the Rothschilds, double spending Palestine effectively. Um, and it was 
the Americans have continued this with their insane amounts of military support to continue until today. And this is the thing. People think, of course, the propaganda that the average uh, um, Israel supporter in the West gets is that Israel is just this stranded Goliath, this is the stranded David up against all of these Goliaths. And if it wasn't for American support with weapons, then Israel wouldn't survive. And of course, this is completely nonsensical. Israel's always had an, a significant advantage in terms of arms over the Palestinians as well as the um, uh, the neighboring countries. And they've always uh, uh, continued to use that. And um, But they would no, be nowhere near as huge the advantage without all of the support that they've continued to receive from the Soviet Union, of course, because uh, the first Zionists were very, very socialist, because, of course, it takes a socialist to fall for uh, such a horrific and criminal idea like public ownership of land by a religious group that doesn't own more than 10% of that land. But in any case, this... Um, entire thing continues to perpetuate. It continues to the fact that the money is printed to support this uh, strand of colonial Zionism, this idea of continuous expansionary Zionism, this messianic Zionism, this idea that what I read in my book from thousands of years ago is more important than the, than your property rights in this piece of land in which you've lived for hundreds of years, you and your family. That continues to get the subsidy to allow it to uh, practice insane amounts of belligerence, so that it is, uh, so that it has been, constantly, consistently, kicking Palestinians out of their homes for seventy-five years, seventy-seven years almost now. It's just been a constant process where all of this uh, propaganda manufactures the story of Israel as this kind of underdog against all this mighty um, uh, Arab uh, hostile sea, when in reality Arab armies were uh, no no match to Israel at that time, especially with the need to mobilize to go fight against the Israelis. And with the fact, of course, this is something that Yaron ignores, uh, it was the, 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 the Zionists had massacred and kicked out 250,000 Palestinians before any Arab army had entered the country. So the notion that the Palestinians were the ones who started that fight is completely nonsensical. It was the premeditated attempt to clear as much Palestinians as possible from the land and back then. And that continues. And that is the strand that is in power in Israel today. It is, you know, people like Smotrich and uh, uh, Ben Gvir, this is their idea. We need to get more land. And they talk, oh, talk openly about getting more land in the West Bank and in Gaza and even in Lebanon and in Jordan and possibly Egypt. The more extreme of them continue to say that, you know, maybe it will extend from the Euphrates to the Niles because they don't have because this is the thing the reason zionism is incompatible with human civilization is because it doesn't recognize people's property right and it subjugates it to what is written in some old religious textbooks and it believes that these old religious textbooks allow people to just go and kick people out of their homes like our friend yaakov who was stealing the family's house in uh, jerusalem this is what it really comes down to. And I think if it wasn't for central banking subsidizing this, this would not work. There is no way that this could work. The only reason this works is because it has an enormous military. And the only reason there's this enormous military is because of the fact that a, in Israel, the central bank has the ability to run monetary policy. But more importantly, Britain and the US and the Soviet Union could also run monetary policy to provide arms and weapons and support to this extremely fiat and uh, horrifically horrifically um, bloody uh, conflict-creating creation that is uh, Zionism, which is trying to impose this European idea, as I said, this alien European idea of uh, ethno-nationalism over a land over the property right of the individuals who live on that land. This is what it ultimately comes down to as far as I am, uh, as far as I see it. And, I, and for me, this is kind of why uh, Bitcoin, I mean... It maybe fixes this. It doesn't fix this. I think for me, uh, you know, Yaron, he says uh, the idea is he, he supports privatizing the land. Well, this is all that I want. So if you want to come arrive at an agreement, if the land of Israel, of Palestine, if all of that is just uh, created in a situation where anybody can buy land and anybody can acquire land, then that's it. And I, I don't care what you call that state, as long as people have the right to acquire and buy land and move around and not be 
stopped, then that would be the case. Of course, the, the, the mind-blowing thing is that he says this as if this is irrelevant to the conflict, as if this is just, you know, passing some ordinance for building codes in the U.S. Like, it would be great if the U.S. would just pass this. Well, no, if the if Israel would pass this, and if the land of Palestine historically became a free market where anybody could buy and sell, rather than 93% of the land being owned by the government, things would be very, very different. It is not the fact that um, it, it it's not the fact that there is conflict there that necessitates that Israel continues to own that land and continues to deprive Palestinians from the fact that they go into that land. This is such a backwards way of understanding this. Thinking of anything, any sane situation, it's the other way around. It's the fact that Palestinians have been denied their land and the fact that a state is being built precisely to dispossess them and take them away because of their religion. That's the cause of the conflict. Thank you, Saif. Uh, Yaren, we'll turn it over to you for the same question with a 10-minute response. What is the role of money and central banking in this conflict? The essential characteristic of this conflict is the hostility of Arabs to Jews in this land. It's the fact that they reject their presence and have used violence to try to eliminate them, extract them, depose them, uh, do whatever they can to get rid of them from the territory. Uh, again, uh, this has been going on since the 1920s, when uh, Arabs have constantly attacked Jews, taken their land, and killed their people. So to present this as, oh, no, this is just an issue of property rights, sure, it's an issue of property rights. The Arabs' denial of immigrants' ability to come in, buy land, and live peacefully from the beginning. Arabs have used violence against those immigrants who have bought the land and lived there, supposedly, uh, have lived there uh, with an attempt uh, for peace. Uh, so I agree with uh, everything uh, Safe said about fiat money. I, I don't disagree. It, it's, a, it's a way in which governments fund wars and fund everything else. So we're not going to disagree on the evil of central banking. I will note that Israel is not unique in having a central bank. Uh, so do the, every other country. Central banking is a is a is something that is a scourge on every aspect of our lives, not on this crisis in particular. I do want to note a few things that I found quite, I guess, amusing. Soviet Union support for Israel that didn't last very long. By the 1967 war, every Arab country that attacked uh, Israel, with maybe the exception of Jordan was uh, was using Soviet weaponry, uh, extensive Soviet weapons, uh, uh, tanks, planes, everything. So um, Jordan, I think, still had British weapons. Uh, in 1948, the Egyptian army and the Jordanian army had both been trained by the British, used British arms. Uh, the Israelis did not have an advantage of weaponry, and none of that weaponry was supplied by the Americans. Indeed, the United States had an arms embargo on the United States. You can look this up from 1947, since from the partition plan, all the way until uh, until 1967. Only post-1967 did the United States provide any weapons or any kind of support uh, to Israel. Indeed, the uh, United States was very skeptical of the, founda the founding of Israel and uh, uh, backtracked, uh, you know, before May in its support for an Israeli state. It, it was uh, only accepted a fait accompli when it actually happened. This idea of dropping in the Rothschilds at every opportunity, <laughs> really. Um, I mean, the United States did not enter World War I because of Zionists. The United States entered World War I for other stupid reasons, very stupid reasons. Um, one of the stupidest uh, wars in human history, and certainly America had no business getting involved in it. Um, the United States did not enter World War II because of the Rothschilds. Uh, the United States entered World War II because of Pearl Harbor and because Hitler declared war in the United States. Uh, Zionists had no influence in the United States, or uh, Jews had no influence in the United States. And testament to that was the fact that Jews couldn't immigrate to the United States starting in 21, and they wouldn't even save Holocaust survivors or, or people escaping the Holocaust. They wouldn't, because Jews had so little influence on the American administration. FDR was arguably an anti-Semite himself. So uh, th this idea that Jews somehow were pulling the strings behind uh, the curtain, uh, determining who goes to war with whom, is is ludicrous. Um, uh, let me just say something about this borders. Uh, Safer said this a number of times. 
Israel has clearly defined borders except for one place. Uh, it has clearly defined borders with Lebanon. There's no question what the border is. It's it's recognized by Israel and Lebanon. It has clearly defined, it is uh, annexed the Golan Heights, so it has clearly defined borders with Syria after the annexation of the Golan Heights. Uh, it has, for the most part, clearly defined borders with Jordan and certainly with Egypt. There's a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan defining borders. The only place in which Israel does not have clearly defined borders is the West Bank. It even has clearly defined borders vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Uh, it, it does not want Gaza. It left Gaza. It abandoned Gaza, however you want to call it. But Gaza's been left alone from 2005. So uh, it's the Palestinians who have completely screwed up and messed up Gaza. Israel has nothing to do with it. Uh, so the only place in which there's a border dispute is the West Bank. And, you know, I agree with SAFE about the nuttiness of the Messianic Jews, about the religious crazies, about the people who would steal Arab land. I defend the property rights of all the Arabs in the Palestinian in, um, in the West Bank uh, uh, to their own property. And if the state of Israel confiscates Arab land, I would hope that the courts in Israel would return it to the Arab land as they have on occasion. Um, and uh, and if they don't, I'd condemn it. They have an occasion. I mean, again, safe. Or you can only see one aspect of this, but the the reality is that the courts have often in Israel sided with Arabs and even uh, Palestinians in the West Bank on property rights disputes. It is not true. It is just completely bogus that Israel has a policy of systematic discrimination against Arabs when it comes to property rights. Um, uh, I am all for selling all 90% of the land to whoever will pay the highest price to it, be it Chinese, be it as long as, as long as the people buying the land are willing to say something to the effect that they will not use it to initiate force against the state of Israel, that they're not willing to use it in order to destroy the state of Israel. Anybody should be able to buy that land. Uh, it is sad that they can't. I agree. Statism. Statism is a bad thing. I wish all the land west of the Mississippi was privately owned as well. Um, so uh, if you're going to use that land to actively engage in war, then no, you, you shouldn't be able to buy it. But other than that, anybody buy it who wants. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, Israel, like, uh, like uh, every other state, uh, has a, a central bank. It has abused it. It has abused the central bank. I lived in Israel in an era where inflation reached almost a thousand percent, I know exactly the evils and the damage a central bank and fiat currency uh, can do. But to make this part of the conflict, uh, I think is bizarre. It, it, it's 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 in the background. It funds wars. All of that is true, but it is not the driving issue uh, of uh, of what is going on. And uh, yeah, I'll I'll end there. So we're going to move on to the next question now. Um, this was actually inspired by uh, someone from the Twitter audience that proposed this question. There's a quote from the sci-fi show Babylon 5. At some point, it no longer matters who started it, only who is suffering. How, question to you, Safe. how do you propose achieving peace and security for both civilian populations and this response time has 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's difficult to answer a question like this at a time like this because um, particularly when things are extremely bad, everybody's just um, so fixated on the gruesome human catastrophe that they can't really seem to think out of it. So it's very difficult to try and uh, talk about this and not sound ridiculous. But ultimately... I happen to have a very controversial idea, which is that uh, people in Palestine and Israel are just people like everywhere else. And if the government of that place treated them like um, places where uh, people uh, accept property rights, regardless of religion, I believe things would be infinitely better. I don't think it is a tenable position. I know for Zionists they believe this, but I really invite them to under, to try and examine the comical nature of their argument that in a land where uh, Muslims, Christians, and uh, Jews had coexisted for 1,300 years, the Muslims and Christians decided that they wanted to 
uh, get rid of the Jews coincidentally on their own just at the time that Western Europeans started migrating to the land to build a national homeland for themselves. So this notion that there's this uh, historical enmity and that these uh, Palestinians are just irredeemable anti-Semites, this idea that people are just born anti-Semites and that there is no way out of it and that you know we, we've seen this happen in Europe, so clearly this is what they're going to be doing over there, ignoring the fact that Jews had lived in that land for 1,300 years and just assuming that um, we are able to just... Uh, uh, Imagine this uh, uh, this alternative world in which, no, this has always been the society. And when uh, Jews had lived there, they had the ability to own property, though. And this is what is different. So for me, I would be extremely um, partial to a solution that brings about property rights. And I would argue that if property rights are sorted, people are able to live uh, peacefully. So there was a way of sorting this out peacefully as long as people accepted property rights. But the entire nature of the modern nation state, and as vindicated by what happened in reality, is that this state was going to take over the land and become extremely um, so controlling and extremely work in favor of one ethnic group in the country at the expense of the other. This is the original sin, as far as I'm concerned. And if we just had a freedom of property there and allowed the Palestinian refugees to return to their homes, and the, an enormous amount of Palestinian land and property is still unlived, it's still empty. It's been destroyed by Israel, and nobody's allowed to enter there. It's designated as military zones or some kind of bureaucratic designation to make sure nobody lives there. But a lot of the Palestinian refugees could return to their property. They simply cannot just because, um, as Yaron explained it, you know, just collective guilt. Uh, somebody did something, and now all of these people are condemned to not have uh, to live in their property again. So I think, ultimately, this is what I believe. If there is a system of private property that respects everybody's property, regardless of their religion, you would have people able to live there in peace, as they had for 1,300 years before this, mostly. And if you don't, then I, as as I understand economics, I can only see that this is going to lead to, unfortunately, interminable conflict, or uh, one side completely eradicates the other. And I think this is where we are, unfortunately, right now, where um, Israel is essentially eradicating the Palestinian population. Um, starting with Gaza, and I think the plan in the West Bank is the same thing. If you look at, um, see here, of course, Yaron just cops out when we're debating this by saying, um, I condemn it. You know, if the Israeli government takes some land and then gives it to some Palestinian, then I condemn it, which is some, you know, some completely meaningless um, uh, statement that you can give here. But ultimately, this is an insane violation of property right that is the lived experience of the vast majority of Palestinians. The vast majority of Palestinians, a Palestinian who spent most of my life dealing with Palestinians, the vast majority has have dealt with direct dispossession by the Israeli state. Sometime between 1947 and now, and even before that, many, most, vast majority of Palestinians have lost land, property, because of Israel. And so this continues. And Yaren just... Um, because his vision is, you know, Silicon Valley on the Mediterranean, this is what Israel is just, uh, uh, it's an amazing fantasy. Um, he forgets that, that there is that aspect, which for millions of people has destroyed the, so much of their lives and ruined it. And when you just talk about it as if it is just, oh, well, I condemn them. I condemn this kind of messianic Jew, Judaism that wants to uh, uh, take over other people's land. This is what's in charge of the Israeli government. This has always been a significant force in the Zionist movement from before 1948. This is why they had built an army rather than try and coexist with the local population. This is why they uh, launched massive amounts of ethnic cleansing. This is why they continue to steal and take more and more land. And why they invite people from all over the world to migrate that land to that land while preventing the owners of that land from staying on it and kicking them out into other countries. So if you just if you take away that injustice, if you take away this enormous intervention in reality, this enormous market failure effectively or government failure, government intervention in the market, you know, 
it's so common sense for somebody like Yaren to see why government is intervening in the market for corn, then that creates problems for the corn market. If it's interfering in the market for um, cars, then that creates worse cars in all kinds of ways. We can see why government interventions fail in so many different ways. We can see why they involve violations of property rights and why they are effectively a form of central planning. And we know the, the problems of that. And yet, for some reason, land in Palestine is one thing that needs to remain in the hands of that government. And yet it has no qualms about supporting that government and thinking of it as something that is moral, that is helping the world, when its entire existence is predicated upon the dispossession of people, the mass dispossession of people and the continuing dispossession. And we see this and you, you see you, the settlements in the West Bank now have something like 800,000 Jewish uh, settlers. Of course, no Palestinians are allowed to buy property in Israel. Even the ones who lost property back then can't go there. Even Palestinians in Israel sometimes can't go back to their own property who have, you know, Arabs who have Israeli passport. They cannot go back to their property, which is prevented because it's owned by the government. And that's supposed to be just some inconsequential detail. So for me, this is, I believe, how I would um, approach some kind of a solution if I were asked. And I think any kind of uh, talk about peace ultimately comes down to this. So anybody, of course, everybody wants peace. Everybody can virtue signal about, I want peace. But here's the question. Do you accept a peace in which somebody else, in which everybody is able to own property and everybody is able to coexist? And I think here, the you know, for Palestinians, the notion that this would be something that is unacceptable is really difficult to maintain because for 1300 years, it was the default. There were Jews, there were Christians, there were Muslims, and everybody was able to own and buy land. So it would be, I think, some way to solve it. And I think if Israelis started to think about it in a sort of property rights focused manner and just got over the um, of course, enormous amount of statist propaganda and ethnic uh, bias that uh, colors these kinds of uh, decisions and this kind of thinking about it, Ultimately, you would not accept this kind of dispossession if you lived somewhere else. If you were, I, I'm, I, again, I've asked Dan this question over and over, and he continues to refuse to answer. But if he was experiencing this in the U.S., if somebody was doing to him what happened, somebody like Yaakov was coming in from another country and kicking you out of your home in the U.S., saying that you know the court is going to obviously kick you out and is going to give it to me or some other person who is from my tribe. If this was happening, what would you do about it? Is this something that you would fight or is this something that you would just uh, accept? And once you accept that this is something that nobody wants, and this is, you know, I say this is not somebody who's uh, fought. I mean, I'm not uh, somebody who's um, really um, chosen that path in my life on this issue but a lot of people choose to a lot of people did a lot and i know a lot of these people and it's um it's somehow expected of them it's uh, of palestinians to just accept this idea that look there's this other court system that's focused on this notion of getting as many jews from all over the world as possible to this land to settle it that's constantly building homes everywhere around you and you just need to accept that while you can't live on those homes. You know, I grew up in the West Bank. I know what it's like that you have a, a village that has all of its entire agricultural land has now been cut off because it's been, uh, there's an Israeli wall there and the land has been taken off and then it becomes part of a settlement and it gets owned by the settlement. And that's what's for me the cause of the conflict. So removing that, I think, would go a long way. Yaren, I'll pass it over to you for a 10 minute response on the same question. How do you propose achieving peace and security for both civilian populations? Sure. Uh, peace is easy and really, really hard at the same time. It's easy in the sense that all that needs to happen is that the Palestinians renunciate the use of violence and stop it, right? There's a wall that separate in the West Bank because Palestinians would cross over to into Israel uh, wearing explosives and blow up buses and blow up cafes. The second intifada, which was a 9-11 equivalent every few weeks in Israel. Um, yeah, Israel built a wall, which is kind of pretty mild in comparison to what was going on in terms of the extreme violence 
that the Palestinians ha were committing and have been committed to committing. That is, they committed themselves to committing this violence over and over and over again since before 1947. Um, I mean, this is uh, this is the Arab League Secretary General Azam uh, uh, in in uh, October of 1947, right? Uh, talking about the war that is going to become, and uh, this is in a uh, in a publication. You can find it, uh, and uh, he writes, as this will be a war of extermination and momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Tata massacres or the Crusader Wars. And he talks about how many volunteers are going to come and the Arab world is going to rise up and they're going to just wipe out the Jews. Uh, he, he continues to say the Arab is superior to the Jew in that he accepts defeat with a smile. Should the Jews defeat us the first battle, we will defeat them in the second or the third battle and the final one. So all this talk about property rights, completely ignoring and evading the issue of violence, the issue of the initiation of force. My grandfather was in Hebron in 1929, a student in a shiva, not taking anybody's property rights, not doing anything to the Arab population. When his students, his fellow students were massacred and he was injured. So don't talk about, you know, oh, the Palestinians, they respect property rights, they always have, until, until Jewish immigrants came in to Palestine, bought land, Again, bought land, settled there, went to went to school, did stuff, and they were violently attacked over and over and over again. Now, it's true, not everybody violently assaulted Jews. So there is an aspect of collective punishment here. But the leaders of the Palestinian people, the leaders of those people, uh, repeatedly advocate for this violence and continue to advocate for this violence. Peace will come to that part of the world when the Palestinians decide to drop their weapons. Now, uh, ideally, at the same time, Israel becomes a laissez-faire capitalist haven. That would be fantastic. And all private property is privatized. That would be amazing. Uh, but it, that is, you know, unlikely. Uh, but the reality is that Palestinians both have to drop their weapons and they have to recognize the values of, I don't know, call it liberalism, which is not quite what we want, maybe in terms of an ideal state, but at least a respect for other people's lives, a respect for other people's property, a respect for free speech. I mean, if you look at the West Bank, and if you look at Gaza, and you look at how the Palestinian authorities manage them, or if you look at Egypt, or you look at Saudi Arabia, if you look at Jordan, and Israel says, okay, let's have an Arab majority that establishes a state like those states. Well, of course, we're gonna, they, they're going to resist that, because those states are horrible, horrible for human existence. Safe said something about, oh, technology was on the rise. Well, where's that technology? Where's the Silicon Valley in Jordan? There isn't one. Uh, why is Jordan so poor? Why, why all these countries that don't have oil so poor? Because they have statist regimes that don't respect property rights, that don't respect um, entrepreneurship, that don't respect building and creating. They don't respect free speech. They don't respect the things necessary to create technological advance. Technological advance does not come in a vacuum. It doesn't come because people give it to you. It comes, it requires you creating it, and that requires a certain... Uh, approach a certain culture. So if the Palestinians are willing to adopt a culture of freedom, willing to adopt a culture of free speech, willing to adopt a culture of property rights, of respect for property rights of Jews and everybody else, if the Palestinians are willing to say, we're not going to rape, pillage, and, uh, and uh, kill people en masse at every opportunity we get whenever we see Israeli weakness, then peace is easy. Peace uh, is easy. The challenge is changing Palestinian culture. I mean, Safe talks about uh, Israel owning 90% of the land, which I agree is terrible. I, I'm just curious how much of the land the Saudi Arabian monarchy owns in Saudi Arabia. How much of the land in Jordan is owned by the government? How much of the land in Egypt is owned by the government? In all those states, it's massive numbers. It's, it's uh, it, you know, in Saudi Arabia, it's basically 90%. And they own all the oil, right? So they own oil... 
the uh, the uh, 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 resource rights in addition. The only country in the world in which individuals own natural resources is in the United States of America. There's no other country in the world where that is available. So yeah, there's a lot of work to bring liberty and freedom and pop and a true respect for property rights to the world. But to blame Israel is the only country in the world in which there no Singapore, which is a relatively free economically country where yeah, people live in peace and they're pretty cool. The government owns 90% of all houses that people live in. Everybody basically leases them. So Singapore should be better, could be better, would be great. But it's not the only thing, right? There's other freedoms and there's other expressions of property rights. Some of those expressions are the, the, the ability to form companies and to, to, to produce and to create uh, uh, corporations and everything else, which there's just none of that in the Arab world. Not, not systematically protected. When uh, uh, you know the 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 um, uh, what's his name SB something, MBS in Saudi Arabia decides that eh he doesn't like some of the rich guys in Saudi Arabia, brings them into a hotel, puts them in prison, takes their property, and reallocates it accordingly. That's authoritarianism. So Israel is light years ahead of those countries. So if the Palestinians want that kind of regime then yeah, Israel's going to resist that. And that's exactly what they want. If you look at Hamas, if you look at the theocratic nature, you talk about you talk about a, a, a Jews citing the Bible, which, by the way, the founders of Israel never did. They were all atheists. But you talk about Jews citing the Bible, which they do in the West Bank. I condemn them. I'm an atheist. I, I reject all that. Um, well, let's talk about Hamas and its theocracy. Let's talk about Hamas's attitude to, to gays and throwing them off of buildings. Let's talk about Hamas's attitude to women. Let's talk about the Palestinians' authority attitude towards religion. It is a hundred times worse than Israel's. And that kind of culture is incompatible with, free, with freedom. It's incompatible with peace. So Palestinian culture needs to change dramatically. If Palestinians are willing to accept, and, and part of it, by the way, is acknowledging their own errors and their own mistakes and their own responsibility for what happened. That is, continuing to tell lies and distort the history is not going to make peace possible. Uh, so uh, take responsibility for the fact that you initiated force. Take responsibility that you rejected the idea of an Israeli state from the beginning and were willing to fight anything, including a war of extermination. And once that responsibility is taken and once the willingness to change the culture is there, sure, peace would be great. And under those circumstances, privatize the land and let anybody who wants to own that land. And let me also say this, because, it, it, you know, SAFE keeps repeating this, and it's just not true. Israeli Arabs who were in Israel when the state was, uh, when, when the armistice deal was cut in 1949, any Arab who became an Israeli citizen, and they all did if they were in those borders, their property was theirs. It was not taken from them. Their property was theirs. They got, uh, they had deed on it. They got title on it. They could sell it. They can build on it. They can do what they want on it. You know, with the exception of what every state does, which is all the zoning and crazy, uh, uh, crazy laws like that. But that is that is equally treated uh, Jews and Arabs. It's just not true that Arabs could not return to their property and could and and do not have that property again in the 1949 post. Armistice uh, border. West Bank is different for a variety of reasons. And I, I will admit, see, I've admitted several times that Israel has made mistakes and is problematic and should sell the land. I haven't heard a single criticism of the Palestinians from SAFE. Not one. Not Khomeini, uh, not uh, Husseini being a Nazi, not Hamas or the, or the Palestinian Authority, not the Second Intifada, not October 7th, nothing. No, no criticism is, uh, is acceptable of the Palestinians or recognition of the of the fact that uh, Arabs in Israel have more rights than in any Arab country in the entire Middle East. Um, okay, so we have talked. Can I respond to the issues that you mentioned here? If you guys would like to do a response, I'm open to that. Yeah, so I mean, I think the obvious question here to Ryan is why doesn't Israel renounce the use of violence? This notion that you're going to have this enormous military that gets all of this equipment and money and subsidies from uh, the US government have uh, just free reign to continue to take more and more land and kill anybody who resists all of their orders for taking over more land. And this is something that has been going on for 75 years. And you can see 
I'm going to link, I'll give you a couple of links for some reports that detail how this has worked. I mean, look, for Yaren and most Israelis and most Americans, they're completely ignorant of this because obviously the media doesn't focus on it. And a lot of it is extremely arcane bureaucracy. But the net result of it is the Israeli government owns the majority of the West Bank and life for Palestinians is being deliberately made impossible. Yaren just thinks he can cop out of this by saying condemnation. And this is why he asked me this completely irrelevant question here where I'm supposed to, you know, what, you didn't condemn this, you didn't condemn that. It doesn't matter who are you and I to condemn and pass these sort of things, these sort of proclamations about what we, of course, I, as an individual, I oppose all form of violence against any peaceful individual. This is not something that um, uh, I need to reiterate. So for me and for many Palestinians, this notion that you want to attack civilians is wrong. This is something that is not new to the conflict that, the, uh, the, the, that you know, um, this is not something that Palestinians came up with, incidentally. In the history before 1948, Yaren, of course, doesn't mention this, but there are much more examples of all kinds of horrific terrorist acts carried out by Zionists back then. One of the, I think the biggest terrorist bombing of the 20th century for a very long time was the bombing of, I think, the Camp David uh, Hotel in Jerusalem, which killed about 90 people. Some of them were Jews, even. And, uh, but when th this form of disregard for innocent life, is something that it was really the Zionists who brought on. It was not, it's not something that was part of life in Palestine. I know, of course, there have been some mentions of examples from the 1920s and from the 1800s of things happening, but really, ultimately, these are like gang fights. Uh, and, and, and it's no, the notion that all Palestinians are collectively guilty and can't get property rights until they change their culture is obviously nonsensical. The notion here is... For hundreds of years, everybody could have rights, everybody could own property, and then you have this nation state that comes from foreigners who build the military, subsidized by foreign superpowers, and robs enormous amounts of land and kicks people out. That is something that he just continues to ignore. Yes, they bought land, but they only bought 5.67% of the land. This is the point that he keeps ignoring. It's only 5.67% of the land that they had bought. The rest of the land, 90% of the privately owned land was still owned by Palestinian Muslims and Christians. And they didn't buy that land. It wasn't through purposeful, peaceful market transactions over the past 75 years that they've managed to acquire that. It was through guns and force and murder and fighting off anybody who tries to keep his land and kicking people out of their homes as is constantly happening. It was through house demolitions. It was through these constant rules that continue. And he still offers no explanation for why is it that Palestinians can't own property, can't um, keep building on their land, why permits are so impossible for Palestinians to build on their land and he makes the analogy with other countries owning property yes other governments own property but all these other governments did not steal the property or maybe i mean some of them might have obviously but what's really problematic about israel specifically is that 800 to 1 million people had their property stolen and kicked out and they continue to be unable to go back to that property and they continue to be unable to un to own property elsewhere so they became refugees in the west bank in gaza and israel continues to steal more land from the West Bank. And this notion that it left Gaza is, of course, completely nonsensical. It continued to surround Gaza completely. And this idea that you're making it about Palestinians and Arabs' internal culture, and as long as their culture is not good enough for your view, then, yeah, it makes sense that they'd be denied property rights. And this, for me, is just incredibly amazing um, lack of self-awareness, this idea that, oh, these people don't respect property rights, therefore they can't have property rights. This is, for me, insane. These people had property rights for 1,300 years before Zionists came along, and under these property rights system, it's extremely stable. I mean, you talk about the re local, uh, the, the no nearby countries, the idea that they don't have property rights is completely nonsense. This notion that Israel is so different in this regard is completely nonsensical, but my time is up. Thank you, Saif. Uh, Yaren, uh, would you like to provide a five-minute response? Yeah, you should visit Israel sometime, and you'll see how radically, I can't. radically different it is. I know. I wish you could. 
because you should see how radically different it is than any other Arab country and how far superior it is in every aspect of life, even for Arabs. Arabs are given a choice, would not want to join a Palestinian state. Arabs in Israel would not want to go to their neighbors. They bless Allah in the morning for being born in Israel because their rights are better protected in Israel than in any Arab state. And again, we're not just talking about property. We're talking about free speech. We're talking about uh, you know the, the the ability to have sex. They're talking about not uh, you know not um, uh, you know killing their daughters because they had uh, extramarital sex and honor killings that are protected by law. We're talking about human rights, individual rights, uh, with property rights are, are, are one, maybe the most important other than life, but uh, just one of. So uh, no, it, you know culture makes every difference. Uh, if somebody if somebody buys a property next to me is a known serial killer, I'm going to try to protect myself. Jews built an army only after what you call gang violence, really. Every time a Palestinian kills a Jew, oh, it just happens to be gang violence. Nothing there. Don't, don't look. There's nothing there to see. The reality is that the Arab states, uh, to the, you know, to the extent that they were states and the Palestinian population from you know, from the beginning of the British mandate was dedicated to to stopping Jewish migration into Palestine and killing Jews who came there and taking their property in, in addition to their lives. They were dedicated to that and they tried at every opportunity to do it. And they they whenever they had the opportunity, they massacred them. This is a reality. Um, so, of course, Israel, the Jews started an army. They started an army to defend themselves. It's absolutely appropriate to start an army in self-defense. And of course, Israel has built an army since then, built a significant army since then. It built a significant army since then because it is constantly under attack, uh, war after war after war. So um, uh, building an army is, again, an act of self-defense. Israel is not engaged in wars of um, acquiring land uh, for the sake of acquiring land. Uh, Israel was quite, and, and you know, you talk about um, uh, Gaza being surrounded. I mean, again, it's such, it's so ridiculous how, you know, uh, one of its borders, a significant border, uh, Rafa, everybody's talking about it right now, is with Egypt. Let me also say this about uh, the West Bank. Um, before 1987, uh, or before really the Second Intifada, there was no war. Palestinians entered Israel freely. They worked in Israel, that, you know, they slept in Israel. They spent six days of the week in Israel and went back home over the weekend. Millions of Palestinians came into Israel and worked peacefully. And, you know, there was a lot of mutual respect going on. I worked with a lot of Palestinians in the construction trade in 1986. It is only after Palestinians again initiated violence, killed people, uh, that Israel imposed restrictions on travel, put on checkpoints and built walls. In 1986, there were no checkpoints, there were no walls. People in Gaza and people in the West Bank enter Israel freely. Uh, I wish that had continued. Uh, so while Israel is not blameless, and I find it funny, who are we? Who are we to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Who are we to say who are the good guys, who are the bad guys? But if, if you can't bring yourself, you can't bring yourself to condemning certain actions of your own people, of the people who represent your people, then, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's absurd and ridiculous, and it's moral cowardness. So I am happy to say that some of the stuff that Israel does is wrong. Overall, they are the good guys in this conflict, but some of what they do is wrong. And many of the people who act on behalf of the Israeli government are really bad. I, I detest them. That doesn't that doesn't, uh, you know, and why do I say, in what context do I say this? In the context of defending the morality of the state of Israel and recognizing that there are elements of it that are bad. I wish you could do the same, but it doesn't seem like you can. I, I guess I'd say here, if you'll allow me, Robert, I'd say the issue, this is not the point that I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is that making these performative acts of saying, I condemn this, does not give you a get out of jail card of understanding what this is causing. And this is the issue here when you're talking about the uh, 1980s and 90s. You know, I lived there. I knew how what things were. The point that you miss, which is, again, this Hollywood fantasy vision of Israel, 
refuses to acknowledge this real fact of what was going on in the West Bank and Gaza at that time, which was Israeli settlements. By 1990, more than 100,000 settlers had moved into the West Bank, all on stolen Palestinian land, taking away essential property rights from Palestinians, taking away farmland, water. The most important thing is that they took all the, well, the, well, the majority of water sources and gave them to the settlements. I know this. I grew up. You think that this is just, oh, well, it's unfortunate. I'm just going to condemn it. And this is why I think this entire culture of uh, you need to condemn is just so ridiculous. It doesn't matter. It's not an issue of condemning. Of course, I condemn all of those things. I don't want to be part of them. I condemn any targeting of innocent civilians. The point is, I don't, it's, it's cowardice. The real cowardice is to use this kind of condemnation as a get out of analysis card of what happens when these this massive government is taking over land and handing it over to settlers and robbing Palestinians of their land. You just expect this to go peacefully. And again, you continue to refuse to answer the question I've asked you over and over and over again. What would this what would you do if you were born in that place? OK, so that was about a minute and 15 year. And I'd like to give you the same reply time. Yeah. So happy to answer the question. Um if I had gone over to my neighbors and killed their kids, I would expect to be expelled from my property. It wouldn't surprise me at all. If I had been truly innocent and was expelled, I'd fight back. Of course, I would fight back. I don't believe the Palestinians are in the second category. I believe they're in the first category. Uh, so that would be that would be uh, my answer to that. But this look, there are three types of settlements in the West Bank, since we're talking about the West Bank settlements. Three types of settlements. One type of settlement is land that Jews bought from Arabs. I documented, bought from Arabs. Now, some of those Arabs were killed for selling land to Jews, which you will, you know, not condemn, of course, but killed for selling land to Jews. And they built settlements, property rights. That should be fine. I'm okay with that. Second category, there's land that was Jordanian land. The state of Jordan owned it. And when Jordan attacked Israel, attacked Israel in spite of Israel's pleas not to attack, it attacked Israel. Israel, in a war of self-defense, conquered that land. That land, was which was Jordanian states, became Israeli states. There are settlements on that. There's a third category of settlements, which I know you don't like me doing this. I condemn. For whatever it's worth, I condemn. Uh, settlements that are built on privately owned Arab land that was confiscated from those private people, I condemn completely in the West Bank. So, uh, you know, I see the nuance here. You don't, you you, you, you know, there, there's just one perspective for you and uh, you don't see the nuance. And and look, oh. you know, private property, you know, okay, I've answered that. Yeah, good. okay, that's time. Um, this is a good segue into our next question, actually. This term, private property, has come up probably more than any other term in this conversation today. Um, I would like to read Ayn Rand's famous quote about this. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. So, at the risk of belaboring the point, <laughs> may I ask each of you to define either define private property or describe its significance for civilization or both, however you want to take this. Then with that framing in mind, if we can look at this conflict purely through the lens of individual private property, how do you see the history of this conflict and its status today? And I think we would go to safe first, unless you guys think otherwise. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I centered my main intervention on this, so I'm going to try and keep it brief um, uh, on, on this point. The issue for me entirely is around property rights. I'm going to recap the main idea, is that the establishment of the state of Israel was built on the dispossession of large amounts of land. You can't escape the fact that only 5.6% of the land was owned by Jews. About 90% of the land, 90% of the privately owned land was owned by people who are not Jewish. And yet you're talking about establishing a Jewish state, which is insane. I mean, imagine any other context in which 5% of the land is owned, say, by French people in Louisiana, and you want to turn Louisiana into a French home. 
Imagine how inconvenient that's going to be for the 95%. And the problem Zionists have, which Yaren has exhibited over and over and over and over and over and over, is to continue to just refuse to draw the logical conclusions of this. We want to have a nation that is defined by an ethnicity, which the vast majority of the population on that land in 1917 does not belong to. And they think that this is just somehow a minor detail that we can get over. You have the British Empire itself saying they want to establish a nation state on that land. And you have a tiny percent of the population that belongs to that group, to that ethnic group. And of course, it's going to compromise the property right of the rest. And I invite anybody to wonder what would happen if somebody were to do something like this in your local hometown by saying that some 5% minority is going to get to establish a national homeland. Of course, it's not going to work well. And this, this is ultimately what it is. And of course, unfortunately, instead of get, going toward the direction of more property rights, of reconciling all of these uh, problems and allowing people to move around freely and own property, we're heading toward this system where more and more land is constantly being gobbled up by the Israeli government through all kinds of manners that we could spend hours and hours talking about. Bet Senem as an organization has documented it quite extensively, of just land theft, home theft, home demolition, um, ethnic cleansing. It's happened in 48, happened in 67, it happened in the Golan, it happened in the West Bank. It's continuously happening, and it's we see it if you follow what's going on in the West Bank, and I know this very well. The settlers are on rampages going around to Palestinian villages, burning people's homes, burning cars, killing people, randomly shooting at people. A random shooting at schools when students are there. This is normal life in the West Bank. And settlers just simply have this messianic idea that this land belongs to us and these people are the enemy that we need to fight. And people who have been living in that land for thousands of years, you don't respect their property right if you believe in this kind of idea that this religious document overrides property rights as they stand today. Zionism is built on disrespecting the property rights of Palestinians. And this is the root cause of the conflict. Um, that was about three minutes. Yaron, I don't know if you want to take that one yeah. for three minutes. Sure. So uh, Zionism was built on the idea of establishing a Jewish state in which everybody have equal rights in it. It is not founded on the idea of violating the property rights of Arabs. Those rights were defaulted on as soon as the Arabs initiated violence against the Jews. We cannot respect the property rights of somebody trying to kill you. If somebody is trying to kill you, uh, you defend yourself. And part of that defense is them leaving. Uh, so it, it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Zionist uh, attempt to take land. It has everything to do with the fact that Palestinians abandoned their land. And in some cases where there was explicit threat to the security of Jews, they were expelled. Again, about 10 to 15% of them were expelled. The rest uh, the rest left and abandoned that land without abandoning the desire to initiate force and to kill those, uh, the, the Jews there. And the fact that this, uh, uh, you know, uh, refugee crisis has lasted for as many generations as it has is a disgrace for the Arab world because every other refugee crisis in the world, people are resettled. They, they they regain property rights somewhere else. Maybe they sue in court to get some kind of financial compensation. Um, all kinds of things are possible. Indeed, a Palestinian state was always possible. Uh, the, the reality is that the Palestinians reject peace at every single opportunity. They are dedicated to violence. They are dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel. River to the sea means no Jews between the river to the sea. And everybody who says it knows exactly what that means. Oh, Maybe the ones who really get it, I understand what that means. In the Golan Heights, when Israel took the Golan Heights from Syria, and there were Arab villages in the Golan Heights, most of them Druze villages, uh, not Muslim, but Druze villages, those Druze villages have all maintained their property rights. And those Druze villages are thriving. And the Druze in those Druze villages, the ones who became Israeli citizens, serve in the Israeli military. They're that committed to the state of Israel as a state that protects their rights. So again, this idea that Israel is just this machine of violating property rights is absurd and misleading and just absolutely not true. If you're a citizen of Israel, you have 
property rights. I'll say I have to comment on this. Uh, River to the sea, you know where that phrase comes from? The Likud party. This is something that the Israelis had mentioned. Uh, and this is this is the phrase really originally that is the Likud, and Likud is the ruling party. And so this notion that they, they want to get rid of Arabs is not some coincidence that happens because, oh, we haplessly end up defending ourselves and inadvertently part of the self-defense is that a million people have to leave their homes. The other interesting thing is that he continues to use the Palestinians with collective guilt, which is something startling for me that, you know, some Palestinian did something somewhere and then all these hundreds of thousands of people get to lose their right to property. And, you know, all, only people from all over the world who identify as one particular religion can go and get this property, something that would be considered completely insane everywhere else. But collective guilt is just something that is part of this idea that, you know, any Palestinian does anything, then everybody else is OK to uh, suffer all of these consequences. And that's it. Thank you. That was about one minute. Um Yaren, do you want to respond to that for one minute? Uh, collective guilt is a very sad uh, phenomena, but as long as we live in political entities, uh, we suffer the consequence of what our leaders do to us. Uh, the imposition of fiat money on all of us, we all suffer, whether we like it or not, whether we embrace fiat money or not, we're all suffering from the leadership uh, that, is, uh, that is out there in all kinds of ways. The Palestinians, as I said from the beginning, have suffered unbelievably from the horrific nature of their leadership, including their intellectual leadership, which have, uh, which have led them down a path uh, that, is, uh, that has brought them to where they are today, which is, which is very, very sad. They had an a alternative. Alternatives have been placed in front of the Palestinian leadership over and over and over again. They have chosen to reject that since they are the only people who speak supposedly for the Palestinian people. You know, what else is there to do? Now, again, in an ultimate resolution of this conflict, people who could show that their land was confiscated and they did not initiate violence and they did nothing wrong, compensate them. Absolutely. Okay. We have <laughs> covered a lot of ground here. Um, yeah, I no, wanna... we're making great progress. I'm very happy. Yaren's <laughs> almost uh, renounced all <laughs> the bad parts of Zionism. <laughs> I don't think we're making progress per se on changing anyone's view, but hopefully this is useful for the audience. And so we're getting towards the end of our premeditated questions. I have a few questions from the audience that I could ask, but there's one first that I think is relevant to what we've been discussing most recently here that I've generated myself. So there's been, again, this is the nature of language and rationality, right? We need to talk about groups. We need to talk about one another in terms of groups so we can simplify the world. So there's been a lot of talk today about Arabs, Jews, Zionists, etc., right? Different groups, different nations, etc. What these groups have done throughout history, we've talked about throughout this conversation. Are we at risk of overgeneralizing to these group identifications. And I think Safe may have been alluding to this earlier. Um, you know, when you guys use this term collective guilt, right? If someone of one race does one thing to someone of another race, does that then justify doing something to that person's race forever, right? For, in the example of, we're using a, a just hypothetical, not to try to pick a side. It's like, for instance, if a certain group of Arabs attacked a certain group of Jews in the past or vice versa, does that justify taking away the property rights from all Jews or all Arabs respectfully? I would think we would all probably agree that's immoral because the world's made up of individuals, but we seem to be circling that to some extent. So how are we at risk of overgeneralizing? How do we deal with this? Um, this seems to be a very complicated aspect of argumentation and rationality. I'm not sure how to deal with it. So I hope that was a good enough question to get some conversation going, but we'll go to safe first for five minutes. Yeah, I think this is, goes back to the point that I was mentioning earlier, that this notion of this kind of toxic ethno-nationalism that Zionism brings from the late 19th century Eastern Europe and early 20th century Eastern Europe, which led to all kinds of horrific things in Europe. I don't think that's a healthy way of going around. And I think, you know, you see the world heading to world heading toward a world of more uh, property rights. I think 
in spite of everything bad, and I think fiat money is a horrible thing, I still think there is an element of human material and uh, civilizational progress which leads toward people developing more and more concepts of property rights. And politics and governments are a big problem that is stymieing this to a large extent. But I mean, overall, the world is developing more and more property rights. And I still believe this is the root of any solution to any kind of conflict, to have property rights on an individual level. And yet in Palestine, uh, we've had this insane ideology that comes along and says, nope, sorry, everybody who lives here has the wrong God. And so we are going to have to uh, kick some of you out. We're going to have to take some of your land. We're going to have to demolish some of your home. There's immigrants from Brooklyn who want to come and take your house. And we're just going to keep uh, pretending that it doesn't happen or that it's irrelevant. But realistically, for Palestinians, the lived experience has been collective guilt. You're going to get kicked out because you're not Jewish. You're going to lose your home because you're not Jewish. And if the Yaakov doesn't steal it, somebody else will. It's insane. I mean, the, the, the reason this debate goes on, it's completely out of the question. You see, I mean, just simply watching that video for a few seconds shows you just how many layers of collectivist uh, ideology had to be constructed in order to arrive at a situation where a person from one ethnic group is telling a person from another ethnic group, look, we know that you're going to lose your property and you know that somebody else from my team is going to take your property. And this is just a given because it happens, because it's constantly happening. It's happening all the time in the West Bank and in uh, East Jerusalem. And uh, it's something that's going to continue as long as people continue to just ignore the importance of property rights and continue to ignore the importance of individual rights and continue to treat it in a collectivist manner. And so that's why I find it extremely odd that libertarians or objectivists or anybody of this kind of individualist bent whose uh, ideas revolve around individual freedom get boggled up in all these insane uh, collectivist categories where people are treated like groups that are meant to be criminally liable for the actions of others. I find that insane. Safe was given five minutes. He used three of them. So, Yaren, I'll give you five as well. You can use as much as you like. In uh, 2005, Israel basically left the Gaza Strip completely. And uh, there were, quote, settlements in the Gaza Strip. These were settlements uh, that had been founded on, not on our private land, but on, in government land, a, gov a land that had been owned by basically the Egyptians. I don't know who else would own it uh, beforehand. Uh, Israel literally uprooted those settlements, forced people into vans and took them away. Uh, they left behind homes, they left behind, uh, uh, you know, factories, they left behind, uh, uh, you know, agricultural, agricultural, uh, all kinds of uh, greenhouses. That's the word I was looking for, greenhouses. Uh, is there any doubt what would have happened to those people if they'd stayed? They would have been slaughtered the next day, literally killed. And their private property, the stuff that they had built and created on that land, would have been taken from them. But every single one of those people would have been slaughtered. That is the option individual Israelis face when dealing with uh, Palestinians as individuals, as groups. Look, I, I, it would be great if we lived in an individualist place where uh, nobody cared one iota about somebody's ethnic identity or religious identity or racial identity, that would be amazing. And in that kind of scenario, we would have open borders. And I, my guess is we would have a lot fewer states. And, uh, you know, yeah, that that's and property rights would be respected across the board. That's all of our uh, dream. But that's not the world in which we live. And yet the world in which we live is still has better people and worse people still has groups of people that one can associate with good ideas and groups of people associate with bad ideas. The great tragedy of the Palestinian people is that they have embraced bad ideas and that they live by those ideas. And therefore, they are, they are at every opportunity eager to uh, destroy other people because they are Jews. I mean, that's the thing he keeps saying, because they're Arabs. But the reality is Israel is the only country where people have individual rights in the entire Middle East, even a semblance of individual rights. It's the only country that respects people as individuals, including Arabs, including Muslims, including uh, Christians and Druze. No other country does. And in the Palestinian Authority, there's no such respect. So Israel needs and has to be 
super careful in how it deals with a political entity, a culture, and an ideology that is anti-individual rights in every aspect. If the Palestinians respected individual rights, if the Palestinians respected private property and respected individual rights, no matter what your religion was, there would be no issue today in the Middle East. There would be no issue today in Israel. There would have never been a war in 1947. That war was initiated by the Palestinians because they re rejected the property rights of the Jews. They wanted to throw them off the five point whatever percent of the land that they had. They wanted to kill them all. So, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's very easy to pretend that there's a, there are people out there, Palestinian individualists out there, who just want peace and just want property rights, but that's not the reality. They don't want peace and they don't want property rights. Uh, the solution, of course, is peace, individualism, and property rights. That is the solution. But that is not the solution that any Palestinian out there in any position to speak for the Palestinian people advocates for. Not a single one of them. Can I respond to that? Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, write, I'm going to say a quote here from Avram Gershon. Someone from Poland who uh, is the brother-in-law of the founder of Hasidism, who had came to Hebron in, in 1747 and had written his experiences. And he said, in this holy city, there is a Jewish courtyard which they close during the Sabbath and festivals. No one can come in or out all night and they have virtually no fear of Gentiles. Its doors were kept unlocked at night. And when there is a celebration, such as circumcision or some other occasion, the Muslim elders come and all rejoice. And it's not only this, but the local Gentiles, even the greatest ones, love the Jews very much. And whenever there is a celebration, such as circumcision, their leaders come to celebrate with the Jews and dance with the Jews, almost exactly just like Jews. So, you know, there was a world that, that was the answer. Uh, the property rights were expected. They left the courtyard unlocked and nobody bothered them and everybody came and celebrated with them. This is what existed before Zionism, before Zionism, before the ethnic cleansing, before the mass property uh, appro appropriation. At one point, you keep bringing up that quote by Azam Bash and the, the look, the, the Arab armies had no intention of um, destroying uh, Arabs. And this guy, Azam Basha guy, is, he's not an official in any government. The Arab League doesn't have any authority that doesn't have a military. And the militaries were very clear, and you should read Avi Shlaim about this. The, the militaries were very clear about the fact that they had no, they're not going to destroy Israel. They're going to try and keep as much land as possible for themselves, for Jordan and for Egypt. There was no concept of we're going to destroy the Jews. This was uh, fabricated, essentially. Uh, I mean, some of it was popular that people were speaking about, but ultimately none of the military had any idea about it. The real eradication was already taking place, which was the Palestinians that were dri being driven out at gunpoint. And that's the point that Biaran just continues to ignore. That was a two-minute response. Yeah. Biaran, would you like two minutes? In 1948, there was a small community of uh, of Jews living in a place called Gush Etzion. Property had been bought, private property. The Jordanian military arrived there and basically wiped them out, killed them all. They surrendered and they were shot. So don't tell me the Arabs had no intention of killing the Jews. Of course they did. They say so. And why should anybody not believe them? And they acted that way. Time and time again, Egyptian soldiers tried to kill as many civilians as they could in the southern part of Israel. Time and time again, the Syrians did the same. And they've been doing it for 70 years now. So uh, it, nothing really in that sense has changed. So don't try to rewrite history. Now, yes, Hevon, I don't know what year that was that you mentioned, but I mentioned that my grandfather, my actual grandfather, was in Hevon in 1929 as a student. And uh, there was a massacre in Hebron, and he was injured. He had to leave Palestine at the time uh, because he was injured to get medical treatment in Europe and ultimately landed up uh, in South Africa. But uh, yeah, there was peace some of the time. There was not peace other of the time. And most of, and the violence was initiated uh, by certain Palestinians. Let me just, one more thing. I said this early on. Look, there's no question that most Palestinians uh, did not want violence against the Jews, uh, particularly those Palestinians, you know, uh, uh, regular folk did not want, They, as you said, courtyards were open. There was a lot of friendship. There was a lot of good stuff. But the reality was that the Palestinian leadership did want to kill the Jews, did want to get them off the land, did want to violate their property rights. And uh, they stood up the population in order to do that. And they, and they did. They started a war. 
And you know, people lose wars, and it's sad that people that people innocent people suffer in wars. But that is a that is a reality, the reality that is not easy to reverse. So I'm going to ask another question now. I'll give each of you five minutes to respond. Um, there's a quote from Mises that reads, quote, if some people pretend that history or geography gives them the right to subjugate other races, nations, or peoples, there can be no peace, unquote. Unfortunately, it does seem that this style of subjugation seems to be, define much of human history. If we keep going into history and seeking retribution from one another, um, I think we'll basically be engaged in endless blood feuds, right? This is, human history is a bloodbath, right? We've been doing this for a long, long time. And maybe the, this feels appropriate to say on Easter Sunday, maybe this is why Christ taught us to turn the other cheek. Uh, which is much easier said than done. Um, my question is this, how, given all of this confused, bloody, chaotic history, um, how, what can we actually do here and now to start moving the world away from those endless cycles of blood feuds and towards one that we all three share the in idealized form, right? A world that actually universally respects life, liberty, and, and property. Five minutes to uh, safe, I guess you would be first this time. Or Yaren, either one of you guys that want to take it. Happy to go first, whatever you want to. Yeah, go ahead. I, mean, I would say we have to educate people about, the, about individualism, about uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's no shortcuts in the world. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, I agree with Mises' quote 100%. I think he's absolutely right. And uh, the way to achieve peace is to bring about liberty and freedom, to bring about individualism, the caring about individual rights. And uh, that would eradicate uh, anti-Semitism, which, of course, would, uh, you know, do away with the need for a, a particular state that allowed Jews to emigrate to because they could go anywhere. Uh, you know, freedom would be fantastic. Freedom is the solution. But the only way to do that, there are no shortcuts here, is to educate people about freedom, to educate people about Mises, to educate people about, uh, about uh, you know, not just economic liberty, but liberty more broadly, the whole concept of freedom, and to educate people about a philosophy that is about the individual. How can an individual pursue their life and focus their life on making their life the best that it can be? And I think... If we can turn everybody into an egoist, um, a self-interested egoist, we Robert, we talked, uh, we did a, a whole section on the virtue of selfishness, right? If everybody was selfish in the proper respect, in a rational, long-term sense, there would be no wars, there would be no conflict, everybody would pursuing their own uh, individual, uh, you know, uh, uh, capabilities and and making the most of their own life, recognizing that the best for them is the trade a principle, win-win, uh, you know, trade with other individuals, and um, war would be gone from humanity, and the way to get there is through education. I, I don't see a shortcut. Uh, you know, politics is not the solution. It's all about educating people about these ideas. Yeah, I'll agree. I, I think I agree with uh, everything that Yaren said, but I would take that to its logical conclusion, which is that we have a serious issue of the violation of the property rights that is inextricably linked to the creation of the state of Israel. You've built, again, go back to the point, you've built an ethnic state on a land on which that ethnicity owned 5% of the land only. And for and, and people who are from a different ethnicity own the vast majority of the land. These people got dispossessed. Very large numbers of people got dispossessed. And that is, uh, for me, an enormous problem on a global scale, not just on, an, on a, for me as an individual, as a, somebody whose family uh, has suffered from this. For me, I think this injustice continuing to be uh, promoted uh, and, 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 and sustained and subsidized to such an extreme and obscene level by the United States government, uh, which is the world's only superpower and the world's only magic money printer that really uh, works. And... Uh, this state is, uh, you know, the, all of these programs are subsidizing this um, 
political ideology, which is built on stealing land. And again, Yaren can whitewash it all he wants, but look into the agendas of the settlers that are building settlements in the West Bank. They've moved so many people. They continue to confiscate land. They continue to take land from people. They continue to burn people's olive trees that have relied on for centuries in order to, to make the land unusable and then kick people out and then turn it on into land that becomes settlements and then military needs and all of that stuff. This is a serious problem. And you can't just say, I condemn it and think that that gives you a get out of jail card effectively. There is a serious issue in that you need to come to terms with the consequences of that. You, what you're promoting as a virtue of, uh, 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 as a paragon of virtue is built on the violation of property rights. And for me, this is why the conflict creates such a problem because people who are in this region, who are familiar with it, know that there was a real tragedy that happened to the Palestinians. And yet they see that the Western world treats it as if it was the greatest thing that ever happened because there was no tragedy. And anyways, it was their fault. And, you know, well, they left and they're all collectively guilty because of uh, reasons. And therefore, we can't give them the property rights. And for me, this is a massive, massive shift, uh, massive um, hypocrisy. You see it also all over the world. I think when the world gets polarized over this issue, which happens periodically, unfortunately, is that some people just simply look at this objectively as, and, and, and realize it's not right to be taking these people's homes and kicking them out and destroying their community and destroying their nation and destroying their ability to live together. And yet, on the other hand, some people are just completely oblivious to this because they prefer to presume that the romantic version is what matters and the collateral is just collateral. It's just humans that we're going to um, get over. And, 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 and Yaren keeps saying, you know, started the war, but ultimately the, 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 the systematic ethnic cleansing of parts of Palestine started long before Arab armies entered. So you're talking about a state actor that is engaging in real terrorism against the civilian population, moving people out, and you keep ignoring this. So I, I think if we, if we want to actually work on uh, something that, and educating people, I would say let's educate people to the idea that property in land of Palestine should just get rid of all of the ethnic baggage and just become a free market. Thank you, Safe. Thanks to my friends at Swan Bitcoin for supporting the show. Swan sponsored the Sailor Series, and I appreciate their support from the very beginning of the What Is Money show, and I'm happy to welcome them back. Swan has grown a lot since then. They've built a full-service Bitcoin-centric financial services company with several different offerings. With the Swan app, you can set up instant and recurring Bitcoin buys. And with this, you can get started at swan.com slash breedlove. Swan also enables clients in the U.S. to hold Bitcoin directly in an IRA account, so you can hold Bitcoin in a tax-advantaged way. Get started at swan.com slash IRA. If you're looking to buy more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, check out Swan Private. You'll get concierge support for buy execution, retirement accounts, inheritance and estate planning, and access to exclusive events, research, and other content. Get started at swan.com slash private. Swan Institutional provides financial services to institutions, including Bitcoin-backed lending, asset management, principal investments, Bitcoin services for financial advisors, and Bitcoin mining operations. For those new to Bitcoin, I recommend checking out Swan's Welcome to Bitcoin course at swan.com slash welcome. So go to swan.com slash breedlove today to get started on your Bitcoin buying journey. Are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing? If so, you need to be at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee on July 25th through 27th. As the largest Bitcoin and fintech conference in the world, Bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon. Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference 
and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference. Again, that's b.tc slash conference discount code BREEDLOVE. Um, and thank you both for indulging my philosophical question. Can I do a one, a one minute response to that? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. The war started in 1947, and the war was initiated by Palestinians, not by Arab armies, by Palestinians. Uh, so, you know, this this idea that the cleansing happened before the Arab, yeah, that people left before, but they left because they initiated force, uh, and they left because they were afraid. Um, uh, there is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. But the victim here is Israel, not the Palestinians. Again, the victim is that on which you know, violence is inflicted. Um, you keep talking about property rights, but you cannot have property rights without the elimination of violence. Violence is a prerequisite for having property rights and protecting property rights and respecting property rights. That party, which is violent, property rights are negated in the face of violence. And you talk about an agenda. God, I mean, yes, the, the agenda of certain people in the West Bank is horrible and I and I condemn it. But the agenda of the PLO, the agenda of Hamas, the agenda of the Palestinian Authority, not just towards Israel, but towards their own people, is despicable and disgusting and ridiculous. And to give those people suddenly the ability to come into Israel freely and to take property without them having renounced violence is suicide. And no, no individual, never mind, no individual wants to commit suicide by granting his enemy, somebody committed to his own destruction, to live next door to him. Okay, thank you, Yaron. So yeah, I'll just like say there was, this is ridiculous because there was no Palestinian army. There was no Palestinian state in 1947. No, there wasn't. The Palestinian the Palestinians were demilitarized effectively by the British between 1936 and 1939. There was no serious military command there was no army. There was no serious equipment. There were a bunch of peasants with rifles. Effectively, that was the only thing that was going on, whereas the Israelis had a serious army. And so when you're always constantly presenting this as Israel is the victim, Israel is the victim, it's ridiculous. There was an entire European army with a lot of World War II vets with enormous amounts of leftover World War II weapons being provided to them and a population that had been completely demilitarized, almost entirely demilitarized by the British since 1939. And there was a genocide going on where they ethnically cleansed people as they had always been aware would need to happen because in 1948, only a third of the population was Jewish and only 5.6% of the land was owned by Jews. How do you build a nation state that is defined by an ethnicity when the ethnicity only owns 5.6% of the land and only... Uh, it represents a third of the population. The answer is mass murder and transfer. It's happened in many places in history, and it's happened again in this situation. Okay, thank you both. That was a minute on each side, so I think we're roughly even there. Um, I want to ask one more. We've got less than 20 minutes here. I want to ask one more question that's quite a bit more banal than the philosophical question I asked earlier. As the old saying goes, if you want to know the truth, just follow the money. Who benefits from this conflict? Whose interest is it to keep it going? Who are the people that are getting paid from this conflict and its related activities? Um, I will open it up to whoever wants to go first. If I were to try and uh, summarize this as a dispassionate economic analysis... I would say we just have a uh, form of violent intervention in the market, which happens quite often. All kinds of central planning take place. In this case, the market concerned is the market for land in Palestine, in historical Palestine. And this land is, uh, there, is a, there is an entity, which is the Israeli government, which has a military, which acquires that land and kicks people out from it. And it provides a subsidy for anybody who comes from anywhere in the world and identifies as Jewish to take part of that land. So the beneficiaries effectively are people who take advantage of this as immigrants, which is a nice thing to have. Uh, you know, if you're an American or a French person, you're just American, you're French, you're stuck with America, you're stuck with France. But 
um, if you just identify as Jewish, then you can uh, you've got a backup plan. And of course, a lot of uh, criminals do it to escape um, uh, prosecution, which is a story for another day. Of course, Yaron gets into the um, you know finds individuals who committed bad things and then just projects it on an entire culture and predicates um, property rights on this culture fixing itself. Um, but of course, if somebody were to do the opposite, I can imagine how um, different uh, his reaction would be. You do not collectivize guilt, and therefore people are um, individuals. And that's what ultimately um, matters. So as a dispassionate economist, I would say this is the kind of root uh, uh, distortion, and that distortion is maintained through the Israeli military continuing to... Um, allow this theft to happen and murder anybody who tries to object to it or anybody who tries to fight it. And what maintains that is, of course, uh, enormous amounts of money that comes from the U.S. that has been enormously influential in this regard over the years militarily. And, of course, the military technology that comes as well. And, um, of course, that's always a winning deal uh, for uh, military industrial contractors who benefit from this. And so... Having constant war is constantly beneficial, and uh, when bad things happen, I mean, it's been a boon for military contractors. So the money printer goes uh, wild when these bad things happen. So there is a perverse incentive here for a lot of uh, people who uh, profit from this happening, and that's why I think um, that helps explain when you combine this kind of economic analysis with the kind of messianic um, land conquering and land theft ideology, you get a sustainable dynamic that is uh, quite honestly, I would say, doing something that is not um, not really common in today's world to witness this kind of um, deliberate um, and systematic ethnic cleansing of a population by a population, by a government that is... Uh, that is pretending to be moral uh, and pretending to be very good about it. Okay, thank you, Saif. Um, Yaron, if you will unmute. Yeah, so I'll say there is no such thing as a, there is no, uh, we'll put it this way, there's a tiny minority in Israel that believes a messianic land uh, conquest uh, is, uh, is the issue. Uh, the founders of Israel, as I said, were secular. Israel is a dominantly secular country, 40 Nine percent of the population considers itself secular. The other, you know, there's another only fourteen percent are really, uh, uh, really religious. Uh, another vast are traditionalists. Uh, so this idea of messianic land acquisition or land conquest that Safe keeps saying is just BS. It just doesn't exist. It's not reality in Israel. It it is reality among a small group of people. Now, yes, the the two ministers that he mentioned uh, about in the government today. Um, are uh, a part of that, and it's a shame that they are ministers, but uh, it, it is not a part of Israeli culture, and it's certainly not a part of Israeli history, and it's not a history of the founding of Israel at all. Um, in, in terms of the money, I, look, I don't believe that wars ultimately are, uh, are, uh, wars are not primarily history, primarily not is about following the money. History and wars are about ideas. Um, and what determines uh, what determines uh, wars, what sets wars in pace, are ideas. Uh, usually bad ideas, usually a combination of bad ideas. Sometimes good ideas versus bad ideas. Uh, in this case, the fundamental ideas at play are the fact that Israel is a free country that respects the rights of all its citizens, and that the Arab world is not and does not respect its own citizens, and will certainly not respect the rights of Jews uh, uh, who, who emigrated into uh, uh, to Israel over the last uh, 100 years or so. Uh, in terms of who benefits, sure, you can find individual to benefit, but the story ultimately is that everybody or, or majority by far loses. War is a lose, lose, lose proposition. War is not a, a, a winner. As economists, we all know that war does not increase GD, does not increase standard of living, does not increase, it, it's destructive, it destroys. You build tanks instead of building actual things that benefit human life. Uh, so what's the destructive activity? Uh, Israel would be far richer, far better, far more prosperous if it didn't have to fight a war, constant war with the Palestinians and with Arab nations, and we forget that Israel is constantly under the threat of war with Arab nations, has been in its history, 
and I would argue still is, um, and uh, not just Arab nations, but various Islamist groups, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, what used to be Palestine and outside of it, Lebanon and other places, uh, Israel is in a state, is, is besieged by enemies that want its destruction. It invests in its military, not because somebody is gaining from it, but because it's necessary for self-defense. I mean, it's really simple. If Israel laid down its weapons tomorrow, literally, if Israelis put down their weapons tomorrow, they would be massacred to the last man, or mostly to the last man. So that is the world in which we live. You know, it's not, it's not a good world. It's not an ideal world. And that's the sense in which I'm not going to respect the Palestinians' quote, so-called property right here, as long as they as long as they want to kill me, as long as they want to kill me, I'm going to defend myself. And if somebody wants to kill me, I don't. Again, I said it before. I'm not going to just hand over the piece of land uh, next to me. Life comes before property. In order to respect property rights, you have to be alive. If somebody is violating my uh, my my sovereignty as a human being. Um, yeah, I mean, taking their property, defending myself in any way that I can is what I have to do. And that is the state in which uh, Israel is in. Can I respond to that? I'll say, um, the, I guess the difference is that you 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 predicate the respect of property rights on my acceptance of your violation of my property right. I think this is really the issue here. So for me... I am willing to accept the property rights of anybody, and you are saying no. This is conditioned on you being dem being able to demonstrate to me that your culture is somehow nice and okay and dandy enough for me to be happy about it, and then I'll be willing to to accept it. But this is not the case for me, and I think the the the, the point here is that before 1948, before Zionism happened, this was already there. This was already the case. The property rights were respected for everyone. Everybody could own land. And then since Zionism, people have been expelled from their homes and people continue to be not denied their property and people's property continues to be expropriated. And this is the thing whenever Israelis uh, speak about, you know, unprovoked attack, we're surrounded by enemies, we're surrounded by enemies. That's because you're stealing their land. It's a very simple thing. And it's really striking the lack of self-awareness wherein it's just, people just hate me because of who I am. And the fact that I'm just inadvertently happening to kick them out of their homes and take their property is just uh, completely coincidental to all of this thing. The difference, you, you say, well, if the Israelis lay down their arms, they will be massacred. Well, Jews lived in the land and they weren't massacred before they uh, before Israel was established. But now Israel is using this excuse to actually massacre people and kick them out of their homes and has been doing it for decades. And so it's it's an, it's it's amazing how you just completely ignore that and then just scare your scare your uh, you scare yourself from a hypothetical where somehow after 1300 years of allowing Jews to live in Palestine somehow they're going to just decide that now is the time to go anti-Semitic. And it's just insane that you project this on an entire people and then say well it's okay to then keep denying them the right to own property and it's okay to keep exp ex uh, expropriating them. And of course here the key issue is really uh, the ministers that you mentioned, oh, they're not fringe people. They are the most important part of the faction and the Likud party is not far behind them. And it, these people represent the very mainstream of Israel. They are happy with the settlements. They are happy to go along with the, with, with the land expansion. And this is something that, you know, liberal Israelis uh, don't really like to come to terms with, but they just simply want to completely ignore this aspect. You have an, an entire government and an entire military that's being driven by these uh, people. And you could read about them. You can read about Kahanism when you talk about extremism and talk about culture. I mean, it just completely rejects people's rights to own property in Palestine unless those people are Jewish. And that's what's been taking place. It's been covered up with a lot of PR over the years, but this is the reality. And this is why this doesn't get resolved peacefully. Okay, that was a three-minute response, Yaron. I'm going to give you the same three minutes, and I think we're going to put a button on it, guys. All right. My recognition of somebody else's property rights is, is indeed predicated on them not actively trying to kill me. If they try to kill me, I'm not recognizing the property rights. That's it. Um, so, yes, it is predicated on something, on on not non, on, on, uh, non-aggression. Um the reality, uh, so these ministers, 
I mean, it's it's funny to say that in the mainstream of Israeli society, when before October 7th, there were massive demonstrations in Israel against these guys. These are the guys who Israel basically were rejecting. Overwhelming majority of Israelis rejected them and their program. To say that this is mainstream is a complete ignorance of Israeli politics. And a, but it's not more than ignorance because it was right in front of our televisions. It was everywhere discussed the extent to which Israeli society was rejecting and expelling, uh, 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 you know, uh, these uh, these people. Um, and uh, you know, let me let me say this: you know, thirteen hundred years of history. So uh, it, it's amazing to me that the Ottoman Empire is now venerated. The Ottoman Empire was not an ideal. It did not have any respect for people's property rights. If the if the uh, uh, authorities in charge wanted to take your land, they took your land. Um, it, the, the, this was a dictatorship, an authoritarian government. Uh, if the authorities in charge decided that what you said they didn't like, they killed you. Um, it, it, this idea of, of the Ottoman Empire or like before 1948 as some kind of ideal that we should strive for, is absurd. Israel is a thousand times of a better state than the Ottoman Empire was in terms of individual liberty and in terms of the freedom granted to individual citizens. Again, Arabs serve in the Israeli parliament. They serve in the Israeli government. Some of them, if they volunteer, serve in the Israeli military. Their property rights are protected. They have the same property rights as Jews do. To the extent that Israel violates property rights, it violates the property rights of Jews and of Arabs, not just of Arabs. So, uh, there is no ideal. There, there were no massacres before 1948. When I gave you the example in 1929, which is personal, because my grandfather was there. But that doesn't exist somehow, because you cannot, you cannot condemn anything the Palestinians as a group or as individuals have ever done. Um, so, no, uh, the reality is, and, and by the way, it's just not true that the Palestinians did not have an, an army, uh, were not armed in 1947. They were. Uh, the British ultimately armed them uh, during the 1940s, uh, and they got weapons from all the Arab neighbors, supplied them with weapons uh, that, that funneled into it. Husseini had an entire organizational structure with command centers in Haifa and a command center in Jaffa and a command center in Jerusalem. The Mufti of Jerusalem, who was the nominal leader of the Palestinian people, had an entire organizational structure, which is a military structure, that clearly unequivocally, historically initiated force against the Jewish population in 1947 after they rejected the partition plan. Okay, thank you, Yaron. Um, guys, we've gone four hours at this point. Um... I really can I, can I I remember we, we agreed that I would be the one who gets the last word because he got the first word. So can we, I just get did, a couple of minutes to respond to that? We did agree to that. So I will give you uh Yaren just did five. So if you'll take two to respond. Yes. So a few points. First of all, um nobody is saying that the Ottoman Empire is some ideal. The Ottoman Empire had all kinds of problems and it was a status tell hole in many ways, and they did take a lot of taxes. And yet, everybody could own property with a lot more security than now. Now, sure, yes, property rights are fine. You get to lease your land from the government, and as long as you behave, the government lets you keep it. That's the situation. And only if you are Jewish, if you're not, if you're one of the refugees, if you're one of the people in the West Bank and in Gaza, you get to live under that government. You get to use your money. You get to be robbed by their inflation. And you don't get to own property. You don't even get to go back to your own property. And if you do, you get shot. And this is really what it really comes down to. Property rights are not respected. This is a situation where you're continuously denying the ability of Palestinians to be individuals. This is what it comes down to. For you, it's okay that my family gets kicked out. It's okay that people just lose their homes, even though they never initiated violence, as the vast majority of people have. It is perfectly okay for you to see that happen because people are... Uh, collectively guilty okay we'll have to leave it at that guys um thank you both for engaging in this very long arduous oh, can i just say one more thing i'm sorry can i just say one more thing that you could sure, add safe. there go ahead i still had one minute left because you just yes, you did. That. 
you said you mentioned these ministers being fringe and the, the government that the people had revolted against them well no no this is not this had nothing to do with their uh, land expansion agenda that is something that the majority of Israeli society either doesn't see or care about or actively supports Nobody's out there fighting against settlements in Israeli society. Nobody's out there saying we should stop building settlements. We should stop taking Palestinian land. We should allow Palestinians to move around in the West Bank freely amongst each other. No, we need to keep them clocked up in those cantons so we can continue to take more and more land and just expect them to um, happily accept it. Okay, that will be our official final stopping point. Um, guys, thank you both for doing this. Um, I... Don't didn't expect to change anyone's viewpoint today, but hopefully the audience finds this back and forth valuable. Um, thank you both for doing this on Easter Sunday of all days. So uh, I'll let you go and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you so much again. Thanks, thank you guys. so much. Take care. Good night.